Good morning, everyone. My name is Sylvia Rosich, and I'm with Lance Real Estate. I am a Global Business Council member, and I'm here to introduce a person that has long and storied professional resume. He is going to talk to us all about real estate uh, market trends in Mexico and going and doing business there. His, his professional experience has been with Century 21 Region 5, Ontario, California, as a director of marketing franchise sales from 1991 to 1995. He has been a president and owner of Caldwell Banker Foothill Properties from 1997 to 2007. President and owner of White Whitehurt Realtors Foothill Properties from 2007 to uh, 2011. Director of Franchise Sales Century 21 South America from 2011 to current. CEO Century 21 Mexico, Mexico City from 2012 to current. President of Citrus Valley Association of Realtors in 2008. Past board and visitors at the Claremont Graduate University School of Information Technology. Certified in International Property Specialist. Um, since 2012, and but had all his courses done since 1992. He's, uh, he has, is a member of the Global Task Force Referrals and Relocation for Century 21 Global, National Association of Realtors, California Association of Realtors, Director, California Association of Realtors, Member International Real Estate Forum, Citrus Valley Association of Realtors, Victor Valley Association of Realtors, a little bit about his past. He has a naval aviator uh, from 1981 through 1989, attaining a rank of lieutenant as and was honorably discharged in 1988. He attended Claremont Graduate School located in Claremont, California from 1988 to 91, where he received his master's degree in business administration concentrating in courses in finance and marketing. An impressive resume. Now we're gonna have uh, Mr. Mel Wong, our president of the West San Gabriel Valley Association of Realtors, to speak a little bit more, since he does uh, know Mr. Uh, well, the next, our next speaker. I won't say the name just yet. Uh, okay, <laughs> Thank you. How many of you have been around in the old days when Top Gun was flying. <laughs> you may not know this, but naval aviator, Top Gun pilot. I had to throw this in because <laughs> I've known him way back from Century 21 days. We were a big family. But it great, gives me great pleasure to introduce this uh, veteran here. So without further ado, Steve Yeager. Buenos días, ¿cómo estamos? Buenos días. Gracias. Hablamos español? Sí. Claro. Excelente, excelente. So, thanks for the introduction, Mel. That was very nice. And Sylvia, thank you very much. And uh, Ling and Gina, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm excited to be here because I get to talk about all the cool things I got to do over the last three years in Mexico. So, if you guys want to hear about it, yes. yeah? yeah? Okay, good. Bear with me. Um, it, it's quite a bit. And you know, the topic of the, the discussion was business in Mexico, but um, I also do business in Latin America. So, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit too, in South America. Let me get this back on track here. Okay, uh, today we're talking about Latin America, we're talking about Asia, right? Um, and pretty much you're coming from a perspective here in the United States where um, there's several differences, but at the same time, a lot of the things are the same. So I'll be talking about that too. Um, first of all, uh, you know, Mexico, quite a big place, over 100 million people in Mexico and most of what goes on there is from Mexico City which you see right here uh, that's like the third second largest city in the world with over 22 million people 
Um, so we have quite a few realtors running around Mexico City uh, doing transactions. And uh, you probably want to know kind of how they do transactions down there. Uh, someday you will be in touch with somebody from Mexico that's either selling real estate or wants to refer you a client from Mexico. So we'll talk about that today too. Um, it's not all work, we have a lot of fun. As you can see, this part of my staff here, that's our building uh, in Mexico City. Uh, our office is on Reforma, which is the longest street in Mexico, uh, with all the commercial transactions there. Um, we have the numbers that we do down there with my company. Uh, we do 18,000 transactions sides a year, um, and that includes anything from you know two thousand dollar lots to uh, big commercial deals, warehouse, industrial um, development, and that type of thing. And I'll talk about that. We have 125 offices uh, all over Mexico. They're in like uh, 75 different cities in Mexico. Uh, with 2,000 sales associates. Um, I'm going to play a video here. Probably need some sound. Where's David? David. David, sound. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of a feel for. Uh, yeah, it's plugged in. Uh, I'm going to give you a little feel for. Uh, some of the agents and brokers all over Mexico in this video. This video is actually from a convention we did last year where uh, I conveniently lost my speech and I got up on stage and I said, Oli de mi discurso, which means I forgot my speech, and then the video played. <laughs> Ready? <clears throat>
want to go bungee jumping with me? <laughs> Has anybody been bungee jumping? No. no. That first step is just an incredible experience. I recommend it. <laughs> so uh, Mexico is a country rich, rich, rich in culture and tradition. Um, with the Aztecs, the Mayans, um, all the Indians there, all of the influx of uh, cultures from all over the world, you know, especially Spain, of course. Um, so we're dealing with a culture. And uh, you have to realize that when you're dealing with Mexicans because they uh, very much, once they have a relationship with you, everything's done on trust, a handshake. Not a lot of contracts in Mexico. It's like California in 1950, when a purchase agreement was one page. And when you took your real estate license in 1950, when you took your exam, it was a one page written essay, you know? So Mexico, I guess what I'm saying, is, is it, it dates back somewhat. You gotta realize that. Um, but it's a country with beautiful coastline, 6,000 miles of coastline with tourism. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, the real estate business in Mexico. What is it like? Has anybody done business in Mexico? With anybody from Mexico? No? Okay, good. This is a good overview for everybody. The closing process in Mexico is very different than here in the United States. Um, here in the United States, we do a deposit receipt, and we have an agreement between the buyer and seller. It goes into escrow. It goes 30, 40, 50 days, close. Mexico, um, there is a deposit that is given up front, very little amount, um, but the actual contract that puts it into escrow doesn't begin for months after. So you don't have a deal, even though you put a deposit down, you don't have a deal until you actually put a 20% of the value of the house in escrow, and then it begins to go through the closing process. So there's an extra step there in Mexico. Um, so. Uh, notarios, no escrows. Uh, in uh, every city, there's an assigned, a certain amount of attorneys that have been assigned to close transactions, and they're called notarios. Notarios make the deal very expensive. Yeah, here, we have an escrow fee of, on a $500,000 house, what, $700, $800 each side, right? In Mexico, um, the notario gets the fee and it's uh, anywhere from three to four percent of the transaction for the notario. But you gotta remember the notario is, is serving the function of title company, no title companies. So a notario has certifies that the property is, has a, the chain of title and it is legally now the new owners. So that's the, the notario, that's what the notario does. Um, and they are, it's not a job you can apply for, it's a job you're assigned by a government official. So it's a little bit weird that way. Um, typically they're attorneys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, documentation, here uh, we're really spoiled because everything's online and every transaction's documented and we know where to find it. Uh, and it's totally transparent. In Mexico, if you want to find a document, you probably will have to go to a warehouse with 500 boxes and search through the boxes. When a transaction closes in Mexico, the notario has five different books. And they're actually books like this big. And he carries them with him to the bank to close the transaction. And every book has a page in it that's numbered. So five books, about 200 pages in each one, and each page corresponds to a page in the other book. So you have page one, page one, page one, page one, page one, and then you have page 200, page 200, page 200, page 200. And every book matches that page, goes to one of the parties in the transaction. So as a seller, I'd get one of the pages from one book. From the other book, the buyer would get a page. From the other book, the bank would get the page. From the other book, the notario would get the page. And then the fifth page goes to the state. And that's the one that gets filed in a box somewhere. So. If you don't keep your title safe in a in a safe somewhere or at the bank secure, then you might have a trouble. You might have trouble selling your property 10, 15 years later. So, um, so documentation process is uh, a bit outdated. 
Ownership. A lot of people from the United States that want to purchase uh, resort properties have heard that you cannot own land. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of both, uh, well, two things are going on there. One is, uh, within 50 kilometers of the coastline, the, the state, const the government, con the country constitution says no foreigners can own our land. And that came from the 40s when Mexico was invaded by uh, United States, France, and Britain. And they said, we don't want to be invaded by anybody uh, without knowing about it. So we're going to make all of the coastal properties, foreigners can't own it. So uh, today, of course, when's the last time there's been an uh, invasion by sea? <laughs> yeah, Korea, right? So, they, uh, so they're a little bit outdated in that. What they do is they have something called a fideicomiso. And the a fideicomiso is a transaction that you have with the bank. The bank holds your property in a trust for 50 years. And then it re renews automatically for 50 years. Uh, the banks have a good deal in Mexico because they now are in charge of uh, keeping all the records for people that own land within 50 miles of, of the coast for foreigners. Uh, this last year, the Senate in Mexico tried to abolish the law and tried to change it back to private ownership because Mexico is getting killed. If you can't own property in Mexico, but you want to live in a resort area, where are you going to go? Costa Rica, Honduras, Panama. So people, uh, Canadians and Americans are skipping over Mexico and going further south because they can own their land there and they have all the rights of ownership. And in the United States, you know, we're pretty spoiled about private property, so we want to have ownership. Uh, so that's what's going on there. Um, within 50 kilometers of the coast in the interior, you can let own your land outright. So you can have a ranch, you can um, have uh, agriculture, uh, you can own privately all that land, which is a good thing. Um, so the closing process is different. Uh, the, the ownership, you got to be careful about that. Um, and finally, I did want to touch on one of the issues in uh, Mexico that they have, um, which you can, if you're careful, it's not a problem. And uh, I don't know if you heard about that Trump property down in Ensenada. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Tilted? No, that's different, okay? That was a building problem. Um, the lands in Mexico were given to the Indians, to the uh, um, ejidos. citizens, yeah, ejidos, okay? And in Mexico, the ejidos uh, own all these parcels all over the country uh, as groups, as families. And if they try to sell that to an individual, um, every member of, or the owner of that property of the Indians needs to agree to that. And the process takes five years to, to uh, convert it from ejido land to private land. And many, many people have been buying land uh, from the Indians uh, illegally. You know, the Indian says, okay, here's my title, da da da. You know, five years later, his brother comes along and says, hey, I never sold that. So he has to give it back. So that's uh, really important, uh, something you gotta watch out for if you're gonna buy land in Mexico is who actually owns the land. Professionalism wise, uh, they do have an association of realtors that is affiliated with NAR. In Mexico, you can't call yourself a realtor if you belong to the uh, what's called AMBI. Uh, AMBI has uh, all over Mexico only like 2,300 members. So not a lot of um, professional real estate strength in Mexico. And that's the one thing that really opened my eyes was uh, that's something we take for granted here in the United States is, yeah, we have an association, but we are so powerful as a united group of members versus uh, in Mexico, uh, all the realtors are divided. Um, you, have, you have divisions by geography. You have uh, divisions by uh, specialty, land, uh, residential, commercial. Uh, there's no one unifying entity for realtors in Mexico. So when you're talking to a realtor in Mexico, you really can't expect to have him have the same services that we have here in the United States, which is really unfortunate. Um, they're trying to do something about it, but I think it's going to be a while. Um, licensing, forget about it. There is no licensing in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. If you want to work for several brokers, go ahead. 
Uh, there's no supervision from the state level to the you know local level of realtors. Um, you saw in the video all of the realtors that were wearing gold coats, right? So you assume, oh yeah, they're in their office, their supervision doesn't take place other than if there's a really good broker and he knows the system uh, on how to run a real estate office so that you're supervising your agents. Um, so, and, you know, and one of the offshoots of that uh, is agent splits, right? Here in the United States, uh, splits for agents, 75, 80, 85, 90. In Mexico, if you're an agent that is within two years being in the business, it's 20% to the agent. Oh. Awesome. 20, yeah. So if you're, if you're a broker, great deal. How many deals do you have to do every month to break even? Maybe five, you know? Um, so the broker's making 80% on the side, or 60% on a, you know, on the whole transaction, put, put both sides together. Um, so the agents, because of the way, the lay of the land, um, and it makes sense, you know, in, in Mexico, if you're an agent, you're pretty much a bird dog. You're out looking for somebody that wants to buy or sell, and then all of the transactions handed over to the broker and the notario. So really, you know, you're thinking uh, here in the United States when you're doing a transaction, you know, we're doing it all, you know? We're the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, you know? Uh, there, there you just, you turn it over to somebody, okay? So it's a little bit different that way. Um, no MLS, okay? They claim they have an MLS. <laughs> uh, the the uh, evolution of MLS in Mexico has been really interesting because when we first got there 23 years ago, the uh, 80 to 85 percent of the transactions were done outside of brokerage. They were done just by someone down on the street corner, what they call Maria's. Um, uh, which is just uh, a, a woman that knows the neighborhood that's been there for years and years and she knows oh someone's sister's brother's cousin's nephew is going to sell so she'll walk you over there and, well, then walk you to the notario and she'll make a commission okay that's a maria um today uh, it's kind of evolved to something that we call instead of a, a maria they say well it's a patito and a pat, you know a pato, a pato yeah pato is a duck right well patito is an office in Mexico, that's just scrapping by. You know, they're a they're an electronic shop, they're a, a bakery, and they're also a realtor. You know, a patito. Um, so now in Mexico, you know, probably fifty to sixty percent of the transactions are now through realtors after twenty three years. Uh, but there's no MLS, so there's no agreement between realtors. So you have the thing in Mexico where brokers are still trying to hide their transactions. You know, so nothing gets sold because they're trying to hide it and they don't want somebody else to steal it because there are many, many, many open listings in Mexico. Okay. Remember that seal, open listings? Mm -hmm. um, so with, with, um, with, with the franchises, ERA, uh, Real, uh, Realty World, uh, Remax, Coal Banker, Century 21, the franchises are doing ex uh, exclusive listings. So 90, 80 to 90 percent with the franchises are exclusive. So, so, and the franchises share with each other. The franchises have their own databases, uh, but it's not an MLS. There's no concept of doing a CMA in Mexico. Okay, forget about it. You go to a, <laughs> it's my biggest complaint. Because here I am with a, a listing presentation that I have in the United States that talks about taking control of the transaction. Well, how do you take control if you don't know what the prices are other than what's listed, you know? So you go, they go to the seller and they say, how much do you want to sell it for? And the seller goes, oh, I think it's worth it. You know, you know how that is. Down the street, my, my neighbor said he got $10 million for his house. Well, it's really a million, you know? So uh, the seller controls the transaction that way. So we're constantly telling the agents, hey, you know, know your neighborhood, be a specialist. Ensure if you're a specialist, you're going to know what's selling. You're going to know what is selling in these little condominium units or uh, little small neighborhoods and that type of thing. Because that's the only way you're going to get comp information. What, what actually is sold and how much. Otherwise, it's just you know what the listings are, which are all, you know, high in the sky. Um, government reforms. This is, a, this is a bright spot for Mexico, is how the government is trying to 
um, become a country that's uh, emerged. Right now they're emerging, but they, they want to emerge. And all these government reforms um, have things to do with uh, mortgage lending, okay? In uh, Mexico, they have a program for employees that puts money aside for the employee every paycheck that you can use towards housing. Yeah. So um, the, the government decided that uh, with all these funds they have in the bank for to buy homes, that they should subsidize <coughs> new homes for people. Well, that ran into some problems, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, money laundering, all the drugs that you and I are doing now. <laughs> well, that's what they think. You know, Mexico, they say it's not our problem. It's you Americans. If you guys weren't using drugs, we would not have this drug problem. That's what they say. And I, I can't argue with them. You know, it's a really, it's a debate that we need to have with ourselves. Uh, when uh, the, the Colorado and Washington State, one other, one other state, <coughs> said drugs are okay, said marijuana is okay. Colorado. Colorado, Washington, Utah? No, no. <laughs> no. no. Utah. Uh, anyway, there's three. Um, that took $200 billion. Arizona? When that law passed, that took $200 billion of um, income out of Mexico. $200 billion. Yeah. So um, it's a huge profit center for them for Mexico, drug trade. Um, so what they did this last year was they found out that what were people doing with this money other than keeping it in a cave somewhere, you know? What were they doing with this money? I mean, they're finding caves in Mexico that are just treasured like a pirate's den, you know, with gold guns and diamonds and chests of money, you know, all that. Um, well, well, the other thing they're doing with it is they're buying real estate. So you have communities in Mexico, all over, that have been put together with narco money. Um, so they, the government said, oh, wait a minute. So they now have this money laundering laws that just went into effect in April, where if you have a client that's going to Mexico and they bring cash, they've got to document where the cash came from and submit that to the government in Mexico. And the government's got to clear it, and then you, and then you get to buy the property. Um, so they're trying to take care of that problem. Is it for the purpose of uh, collecting taxes or anything, or just to make sure that they're not laundering? They, they don't want narco kings okay. to be owning cities. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that's what they're doing. Um, then taxation. Okay. Oh. Yeah. No, nothing is uh, very true. Well, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> In Mexico, people don't pay taxes, generally. Okay. They have two or three prices for their homes when they sell them. There's the price they were really sold for, and the price the government, um, that they're reporting to the government that they sold for. Two books. Uh, yeah, two, 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 two. Um, It's less now, but you know, the old school is is still doing that. The, new, the, the newer generation coming up is really very transparent, and they, they want to follow the laws because they're now living in Mexico. They were probably in the United States for 10 years and went back to Mexico. And they want their uh, streets paid. They want their they got the garbage, garbage disposal. They have the garbage taken care of. And they want their Starbucks down the street. And Starbucks isn't going to go in there unless it's uh, infrastructure is there. So the younger generation rising up, the middle class, um, they're paying their taxes. So that's a good sign. Uh, but the government is, is putting in measures and steps all the time to try and get the, their tax out of the people because they just don't pay them. Um, so that's kind of the real estate background. And we'll do Q and A in a little bit. Uh, what time is it? Uh, ten oh seven. Okay, good. We get ten. Uh, market trends. Uh, excess inventory, quite a bit. Uh, I talked about in front of eat, which I mean not in front of eat. Um, the government program uh, that uh, people save every paycheck, they get to buy a house with that. Well, the government got involved and started subsidizing it with their uh, politicians, uh, putting money in different areas of the country that they want to develop. So they did a really stupid thing. I hate to tell you this, but they did. If there's any reporters in here, don't, don't repeat that. Um, they built communities outside the cities that were so far away that people could not commute. So now they have ghost towns. 
in many, many, many places in Mexico, and there's four million vacant homes that have been built in these ghost towns all over Mexico that are priced from like forty thousand to sixty thousand to eighty thousand dollars for like a two to three bedroom apartment uh, because of the policies of the government uh, created excess inventory. So prices in Mexico. Uh, in these areas are on a little bit of a downward trend. Not a lot, but a little bit of a downward trend. Um, however, their economy is awesome. The economy in Mexico is a, really, a bright spot because uh, you have these uh, labor there that uh, people are building cars. Uh, ten, 10 million cars a year in Mexico. Huge amount of cars being built there, sent all over the world, especially to the United States and South America. Um, so there's the unemployment there is between about four and five percent. Uh, so people have jobs and they have incomes and they can make payments on their mortgages, which is a, a very good sign. Um, public policy, I talked about that a little bit. Uh, you've got um, some states in Mexico that are overspending. They, they spend too much money. They owe too much money. Um, so they're running into some crises in some of the states, and they're firing the governors and putting new ones in there. In the old days, what would they do? They'd kill the governor and put a new one in there. Now they just fire them and put a new one in there. Um, there's, there's problems with that. Crime. Um, Guzman, he, he was arrested last year. Um, uh, what's it? Shorty, they called him. Anyway, uh, the big narco kingpin in Mexico is gone. So, yeah. What's that? A couple. Yeah, Chaco, Chaco, Joaquin Guzman El Chaco. It means the short, the short guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he was arrested. So they are doing something about crime, um, but it's going to take some time. Over sixty thousand people have been killed in the crime over the last five years because of the narco and all that. So uh, it's being cleaned up. It's not there yet, but you can feel confident in most communities that it's a safe place. Trade, incredible story about trade. Um, there's many people leaving China, going to Mexico because of the, um, the skilled labor in Mexico. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Mexico has opened its uh, borders to uh, the world, and uh, people are coming in there and taking resources out, uh, paying huge taxes for those. Um, so it's helping Mexico out quite a bit. Um, and the United States, of course, we have our free trade agreements with them, and that's why you see some of the big semis coming back and forth off the border. Resort area, bright spot for Mexico. I mean, uh, I'll talk about that again in a little bit, but huge amount of uh, tourism uh, coming to Mexico. Five, four million Americans every year go to Mexico tourism um, and pay the, the, the uh, resort fees and uh, provide jobs for Mexicans. And also, people are moving there you know, to retire, which is a lower cost of living, great medical, and uh, other benefits of that. Um, senior living is... Uh, growing in Mexico, that's the next big thing. It used to be Mexicans would bring their parents to live with them, and the younger middle class don't want to do that anymore. So they want some place for their parents to go. So senior living is becoming a, a, a big uh, a development all over Mexico. Uh, commercial industrial, uh, you know, our, I think our uh, opportunity is along the borders. Yeah, I was just in uh, Juarez. Uh, we have a broker there. Uh, and five years ago, everybody's leaving Juarez. Yeah, Juarez. They were leaving it because of the narco problems. Well, uh, over the last two years, they're all coming back uh, because it's been taken care of. So, guess who bought all the properties when the people left? The narco. No? Broker. <laughs> the broker. Yeah, and, and he got to know all the banks because the banks were holding the properties and now the bank says, you're the broker, get rid of them. I don't want to hold these in my inventory. Uh, it's like in 91 here when the banks couldn't hold them in inventory, you know, so they're just giving them out to the brokers. So our broker is in Morris taking those properties, rehabbing them. He's got 200 of them. He's making 100 to 200,000 a house, wow. rehabbing it and the people coming back. So he's doing really well. You know, there's opportunity and everything. But I guess the industrial commercial in Juarez is a huge opportunity. Here, for a commercial industrial, you're going to pay a new $200 square foot, used maybe $150 square foot. In Mexico, you can get a maquilladora, which is like a place where an American would go down there and manufacture uh, for $30, $40 a square foot. So there's a, a huge opportunity for someone that's in commercial real estate to go into the border states and um, pick up a, a building that's already there 
and, and have a lease, 10 year lease, with an American company that wants to manufacture in Mexico. That's an opportunity. Uh, a huge amount of residential development still. There's the government development with the, the funds I was telling you about, but then there's the private industry that's developing. The government built these communities for uh, first time buyers, and they're all like square plots. Very small, zero lot lines, uh, just miserable places to live. But the private industry has come in and says there is still a demand. Let's build them right. So they're building them with, you know, dynamic features, with um, green zones and, and areas where uh, people can go and relax and uh, little commercial areas and that type of thing. Those type of developments, developments are growing, and there's profit to be had in that. Um, Lewis Holmes, you guys know, you know, Lewis Holmes, right? Randall Lewis. What does he do? He goes in, buys a huge um, 500 acres, brings the tractors in, brings utilities, map, gets the map of the plot, engineers it, and then that's where he makes his margin, right? They're just starting to do that in Mexico uh, with these developers all over these big cities. They're going in, buying huge parcels, and, and doing a, a, what I call a Randall Lewis to the, the properties, which is very successful. Yeah. Um, so what's the opportunity for you? That's why you're here, obviously. Um, uh, franchising, does anybody work with franchise companies? Yeah, yeah, that, good, good, cool. I worked with Burger King when I was here, a um, few others, uh, finding locations for them, I was ICSC. Uh, but in Mexico, that is a huge market for anybody who wants to get involved with that. Um, here's the Hooters in the middle of Mexico City. Uh, you're seeing Hooters going up all over the place. You're seeing Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, What's the big one here in the news? Walmart. Like Walmart. Yeah, yeah, Walmart doing this, you know. Uh, so, subways. subways, yeah, a bunch of subways down there. And Quiznos, even, yeah, Quiznos is down there. Uh, California Pizza Kitchen. <laughs> My favorite. Yeah, I lunch every day, I go, I'll go over to the California Pizza Kitchen. Nice. Um, so, th these the franchises are looking for places all over Mexico. So, if you know a franchise company here in the United States, that wants to grow their market in New Mexico, uh, what you would do is you would uh, find a broker in Mexico that's a commercial broker that can find you locations, and then you guys can work together and uh, do referrals. Um, I was at uh, a bar, not drinking, <laughs> in Cozumel, in La Vincita. And uh, just a guy from uh, Wingstop was there on vacation. And he heard that I was the CEO of Central Front Mexico. He said, we're growing and we want to get into Mexico. Here's my card. We talked to each other and now we're, my people are looking for locations for wings now. Uh, families to U.S. Okay, there's a lot of people from Mexico moving to the United States as evidence in, don't get dizzy. Uh, here we go. Um, 50,000 to California, 37. Thousand in Texas, and then Illinois, or so on. But you know, the California number is where we are. That's pretty big. So keep your eye out at the coffee shop for someone talking about their relative coming to town. Because Mexicans have money. They do, especially the ones that come here. You know. Um, and then there's the Mexicans that have property in Mexico that live in the United States. Right? There isn't a day that goes by when our office gets a call from somebody's relative passed away. They have 100 acres in Aguas Calientes. I need a broker, you know? So, so there's people in the United States that are uh, active in Mexico with properties. Um, and then uh, families to Mexico from all over the world. Steve, yes? Are there referral agreements between U.S. and Mexico agents? Yes, there are for referral agreements. Um, it's, it's like a little bit different because they do it by side instead of by the transaction. So they say 10%, which is really 20% if you look at this, both sides. Um, and uh, there's, if you go through the franchise, like I would call the headquarters, Remax, Century 21, uh, Realty World, and say, you know, I have a client that needs help in Mexico. And they'll tell you if they have an office in that area. But I would not, I would not go through anybody that you did not know. I would not just pick up the phone or Google, let's say uh, you had somebody in Leon that needed a property sold. 
I wouldn't Google that and call the office. I'd go through the franchise companies. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, these are, this is who's buying in Mexico. 40% uh, uh, from the United States. Canada, you can't see it, it's about 20%. South America, 15%. And Spain, quite a bit there, too, because of the recession over in Spain, people are coming back to Mexico. So there are quite a few United States people buying down there. Um, I think, really, what I wanted to talk to you about is kind of where it's going. You gotta go where the puck is being hit, you know? You don't wanna be trailing. So where the ball is going are into four regions in Mexico. And, th and this was confirmed by the housing industry in Mexico. So the first one is in the middle of Mexico. Okay. Has anybody been in the middle of Mexico? Where? Guanajuato? Guanajuato. Leon. Yeah. My client just moved out there. Yeah. They, have, they have property over there. I sold one of their properties here. Here? Ah, and then they relocated. Yeah. Very popular. And here's why. Uh, it's called the Bajillo. It's the, um, the lowlands in Spanish. And it, yeah. And in uh, La Hio, they have a lot of manufacturing, Ford and GM. Uh, they have a lot of agriculture. So there's many, many jobs and lots of incomes. Uh, and development is huge. And people are sending their, their kids from there to uh, colleges in the United States, and they're coming back, and they're saying, I want to have a, a business here where I was born. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on, a lot of education, a lot of skilled labor in the Bajillo. So the um, uh, manufacturing linkages, that's where the trains come and go, the airplanes come and go, uh, the roads for the trucks come and go. Uh, so there's quite a bit of infrastructure. Um, and then finally the dynamic economy. There's a lot of new stuff going on, like aerospace manufacturing. Um, and then if you look at the towns that are in the Bajillo, they got uh, Guanajuato, which is huge, you know, uh, uh, tourism. Um, uh, they have, it's not here, San Miguel de Allende. It's the biggest uh, city for tourism from the United States. Like over 15,000 Americans there. Uh, Queretaro, they have uh, 40 families a day moving into Queretaro because of the jobs and opportunities there. They have a lot of aerospace there, building helicopters, uh, providing parts for planes in South America for the Embraer. Um, and then Aguascalientes is where Nissan has huge, uh, you know, hundreds of acres. Nissan builds cars there in Aguascalientes. And then Jalisco is a huge industrial city too. And then you know the um, the city. This is uh, one of one. Gorgeous, just incredible. Um, so tourism there is fantastic. Uh, if you ever want to go there, that's the first place I would go. They invited me to go there. Yeah, you should go there. the food, the people, the the air, everything. Puebla. Huge market, um, and primarily because of the labor. It's right outside of Mexico City. So people can come and go and get their things built there, Volkswagens, there's Audi, they're putting a new plant in there. Uh, and there's all the periphery uh, industrial uh, from that. Um, and it's kind of a cool place because you know, that's the Mount Papa, it explodes about every you know, month, it comes up with steam. Uh, it is gorgeous, just gorgeous. Um, this is on top of one of our offices there. That's one of our brokers. In the background, you, there's a huge plant back there for uh, VW. Um, but the weather is perfect. <laughs> Incredible. Um, then we have on the Yucatan Peninsula, on the northwest side, we have something called Merida. And Merida is a huge draw because of security. You, the, the drugs do not flow through Merida. It's, uh, when you go into Merida, there's always a Somebody watching you, you know, not in a nice way. Not in a bad way. Okay. Really? Yeah, really. Yeah. I was I was going around the corner in my car and there was a guy in a crosswalk crossing and he said, Okay, go ahead. So I went ahead and the policeman running after me. Hey, you shouldn't go and I said, No, the guy said it was okay. He went over and talked to the guy. He said, Yeah, it was okay, you know. So, you know, there, there's a lot of police and a lot of security in Meredith. So people are moving there. It's growing very fast. And they have this port up there called Progreso. And in Progreso, they have uh, the Chinese bringing goods into there because the Chinese are building a city in the Yucatan, their own city. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a big development you hear about, uh, a lot about uh, in the near future. Uh, and a lot of international investment into Merida. Uh, the quality of life, incredible, incredible place to live. Um, I mean, just. I got to go there uh, last year to go on a little duck hunting excursion, and uh, just it was the experience of my life. I mean, it's 
you, you go into the mangroves, and it's just, there's no lights for hundreds of miles, no people for hundreds of miles, and you just feel, you feel a, a, a peace. Uh, so it's a wonderful place. This is the town here. Um, there's, it's just laid back. Um, the other place, finally, is a place called Tulum. Oh, you love it. Okay, Tulum, undiscovered beaches, uh, ecotourism. There are uh, actual developments near Tulum where you buy your uh, four acre plot and there's 100 acres next to it that's farming. That's like papayas, pineapples, peppers, uh, and everything's grown naturally around your house, like in a farm. It's all taken care of for you. So you show up to your house that's around the mangroves and in, in the jungle, and uh, it's just, there's no way for miles. And it's, it's ecotourism. It's a place to get away. It's nature. Uh, everything's taken care of. Um, and then a lot of the Europeans love it. In Tulum. So there's a lot of business coming from Europe so that they can go there on vacation and hang out on these huge beaches. Um, there's, that was right outside my room. This is. Um, I forgot. Um, uh, there was a turtle right outside my door. You know, doing this. <laughs> hey, he's stranded. The guys, guys, come over. No, no, no. He's laying eggs. See, no, he's laying eggs. So they like they roped it off, and, and I had to turn the light off in my room because the, they go to the light, you know. So then it can go back up to the ocean. And then they take those eggs and they bring they take it to a farm where they eat them. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they take them to the farm, they hatch them. And then they let them out on the beach. So it's really cool. So um, that I, I should just leave you with that picture. Yeah, yeah really. Right? Yeah, nice um, but I do want to mention that you know, after three years in Mexico, um, I've been assigned South America. So I get to come back here next time we do this and talk about South America because I'll be in, in uh, all the countries in South America uh, helping with uh, real estate uh, down there. Okay, I think we're on the Q&A. Yes. Good? Ah. I know we answered some questions already. Um, point of view, um, are uh, these, uh, can we sell point of view houses or do they have their own point of view agents? No, anybody can sell them. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, the, the key is to go to the notario. Okay. Yeah, the notario filters everything. He's the key. You know, he's the the pivot man. I'm assuming point of view houses are a little more controlled. So, like, in, are they in a database so people know that they are? Yes, the banks have in point of view houses that are in the database, and, and it requires special financing, okay. which is very easy to get. So people are buying and selling those like crazy. That's the market. Oh, okay. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Oh, one more. <laughs> in the case where there is a property owner in Mexico that wants to sell a property and wants us to market it here. Yes. Do we sign the contract here or can we have it signed there? Do you know what the regulation is? Yeah, like? you know, in California, we are all duped. In California with the regulations, it's yeah. crazy, mm -hmm. you know? It's just hyperlexis. It's over regulation. Right. So we all think, if I want to sell property, I got to go through the DRE, have my license, do this, do this. No, you, you do the contract in Mexico, and you can do whatever you want. I don't mean regulations in Mexico. Yeah. I mean, how are we regulated here? In you're not. See, that's just it. You're you're not. Mm. You can do whatever you want. Right. California. Uh, what is it called? Bureau of Consumer Bureau Affairs. Bureau <laughs> yeah, they have nothing to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you just you, you do your thing and do it as if you're in Mexico. Very good. Thank you so much, right. Stephen um, yeah, sure. for all your information. Okay. Wonderful. We'll be right along. Good morning, everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker, Mr. Christopher L. Ainsworth. Chris is the managing director of the regional investment executive for the Greater Los Angeles and. Pacific Southwest region of within U.S. Trust. In his role, Chris oversees six U.S. Trust offices throughout Southern California and the state of Arizona and leads a team of 38 talented and dedicated investment professionals. 
He is responsible for delivering customized wealth management solutions to high net worth and ultra high net worth families. He currently oversees an access of $12 billion in assets under management and frequently speaks to groups on financial markets and global economy. Prior to assume his role, Chris's, Chris's experience ranges from traditional asset management to alternative investments. From 2001 and early to 2000, early 2005, Chris was previously with Bank of America Capital Management's Alternative Investment Group, where he helped grow the business from a startup to a multi-billion dollar asset management group in just under three years. Since 2005, Chris has worked in various capacities of the investment industry and specifically focused much of his time working on family offices and multifamily offices on their investments. Chris has been a regular speaker and commentator on financial service industry, including CNN and CNN Financial Network and other media outlets. In 2010, Chris was recruited by hedge fund and alternative investment in, uh, in this industry participants to develop an association for California based hedge, hedge funds to act in a unified manner to become more involved in a future financial service regulatory process. From 2010 through December 2012, Chris served as the president of the California Hedge Fund Association, a nonprofit member based organization, to serve the California Hedge Fund community. Since January 2013, Chris has served as the chairman of the California Hedge Fund Association. Since 2011, Chris has served on the Los Angeles Committee for Help for Children's Hedge Fund Care. Hedge Fund Care is a international charity supported largely by the hedge fund industry whose sole mission is to preventing and treating children child abuse. Chris has received a Bachelor's of Science in Economics with financial applications from Southern Methodist uh, University. And today Chris is going to talk to us about uh, U.S. real estate in the global economy. And please join me and give a warm Western Gabriel welcome to Mr. Chris Hainsworth. Uh, I think I need to cut down my bio a little bit. <laughs> yeah. The bank, uh, I guess, uh, wanted to give a lot of information on me, so I apologize about that. So I, I've got a couple of things today that uh, we'll go through. And basically what I wanted to do was provide a little bit of uh, information on what's happened in the U.S. economy, um, what's happened in the real estate market, and how that relates to the international uh, investor or buyer in the U.S. market, and then what our future expectations is. You'll see item number two in there is, is labeled as collectibles because as I dug into the data, um, I, I found some interesting correlations that I'll highlight a little bit as we kind of get into that. So basically, what's happened in the U.S. economy? Where are we today? Um, as far as the U.S. economy goes, we're really kind of the, the shining light on the hill as it relates to the global economy. The United States is doing exceptionally well. I know a lot of people talk about what's going on out there, and they're fairly negative. But um, the U.S. economy last year... Uh, the stock market, obviously, the S&P was up over 32%, um, which was actually mostly driven by what we would call market multiple, which was an increase of two and a half times, so basically moving market multiple from 14 to 16 and a half times, which was over a quarter of the uh, return last year in the market. Um, also, earnings for S&P 500 companies last year was up between 5 and 7%, so you can add that to the 32% return. Um, which is about another 25%. And then what we also saw last year and why the stock market was up so much was we had $300 billion of new money coming into the U.S. stock market last year. And then we also had U.S. companies buying back an additional $300 billion in stock. And so what's happened is that's why you got that expansion in the stock market last year. 
how that relates to California is that in 2013, the state of California received $4 billion over and above what they expected in revenue from a windfall tax in capital gains. And so when we look at what's going on in the state of California and how that drills down into the local level, that's something that is unlikely to be repeated this year if we look at where we are in the stock market returns this year. And hopefully Sacramento has learned their lessons on what's going on in the world and hopefully they don't start spending before the money actually starts to come into the door. Because actually the credit outlook for the state of California is positive. We've got a recovering economy. We've got growing revenue. I know this sounds like an oxymoron, but we've got better governance in Sacramento. And again, an oxymoron. We do have conservative budgeting going on relative to what we've seen historically in the state of California. Um, we've got a more structural approach to what's going on in Sacramento. And they've actually carved out a special fund in the current budget of $151 billion. And they're specifically focused on paying down $6.2 billion in school and community college credit deferrals. They're accelerating $1.6 billion in payments for economic recovery bonds. They're allocating $850 million to cap and trade auction revenues. We've got $618 million for spending on water projects. $815 million in deferred maintenance spending. And they're, they're depositing $1.6 billion in the state's depleted rainy day fund. So I know that it sounds strange, but the state of California um, has actually done a fairly conservative job under the current governor in doing a very good job in the economic recovery of, as we've come out of the recession. And so when we look at what's happened in the United States, and we look at what the growth rate is in GDP and kind of how we're recovering, um, does everybody remember in the early 1990s we had, um, everybody talked about what was um, the jobless recovery of the recession? So if you remember what happened back then, that was really the first of what really has now become the way that the United States recovers from recessions. And you see it in all the data that you see out there. But basically what happens is every time we go through a recession, and basically this goes back and you can see it back in the data there to the 1990s, as we come out of recession, you see um, some accelerated growth in the economy, and then you see some structural changes happening in the economy. And it's basically driven by technology. What's really interesting, though, about what happened in 2008, and even when you look back at the prior two recessions, the dark gray is the prior two recessions, is that the amount of drawdown that we saw in the US economy was just absolutely catastrophic. When you start thinking about the fact that the US economy was contracting at an eight, over an 8% rate on an annualized basis in late 2008 and 2009, we had a long way to go. And what you also see in the data is that when you come out of a credit crisis, when you look at prior recessions, you basically look at growth rates of US GDP to be up in the 6% range for a couple of quarters to actually really spur that economic growth and drive the growth of the US economy going forward. And really since 2008, we've basically hit 4% twice, but we really haven't seen any massive uptick in US economic growth. So even though I talked earlier about how well the United States is doing, what's really happening is we're growing exceptionally well in the US, but the rest of the world is actually pulling us down a little bit and dragging a little bit. So everybody also wants to talk about rising interest rates in the United States and what's going on out there. So I talked about the jobless recovery a little bit, and that's what you can see in this chart. So if you look at the blue line, what the blue line shows is what U.S. unemployment is. First Friday of every month, you see unemployment rates being announced. And we all see what's going on with the unemployment rate. Unemployment right now is sitting around 6%. And everybody's talking about the Federal Reserve having to raise interest rates because, because unemployment's at 6% and it's going to cause inflation. To me, this is a completely worthless number. What really matters to me is who really wants to have a job if they could have it. So anybody know what U6 is? So U6 is actually another measure of unemployment that the federal government actually keeps track of but it's not widely published and it's not widely looked at. In U6 is everybody that's unemployed, everybody that's unemployed that's no longer collecting unemployment, so no longer being counted, everybody that's 
claims to be retired, but if they actually could find a job, they would take it. Everybody that's part-time working that would actually take a full-time job if they could get it, or somebody that is marginally employed. So when we look at that, and we look at what's happening in the United States since 2008, we still got a long way to go when we look at unemployment. U6 is still, even through the last couple of years, is still up around 12%. So that's a pretty shocking statistic when you think about it. So how does that relate to California? Well, California GDP didn't contract quite as much as the United States did, and it's actually growing exceptionally faster than people expect. It's doing really well here in California. But again, what's really interesting when we look at unemployment in California is the unemployment rate in California hit 12%. It's sitting at a little, just under 8% today. But that's the scary statistic to me right there. State of California, U6 is 17%. What's really interesting about this is it doesn't even cover all of the jobs. So when we actually look at what's going on in California, the U6 and the true unemployment has been, it, we still got a long way to go even though things are going well. The challenge that we have across the United States and in California as a whole is you have massive structural changes in the economy that have taken place since 2008. And what's happened is all of these people that are unemployed are structurally unemployed, which means that they're unemployable. And what I mean by that is the job market has changed. They don't have the technical skills or the knowledge base to actually get a job in the current market environment. So when you think about it, has anybody ever seen a YouTube video of what it takes to build a Tesla car? Anybody see? So somebody see, how many people does it take? Two or three. So it takes two or three people to actually build that entire car. The whole thing is built by robotics. So the state of California is doing absolutely terrific. The technology industry, manufacturing in California is close to an all-time high. Manufacturing unemployment hasn't moved since 2008. And it's because people are structurally unable to fill the actual roles that are able to be out there. And so when we look at what's going on in the US economy and how interest rates look and what's gonna happen with the Federal Reserve and what's the likelihood of short-term interest rates moving up, which then translates to mortgage rates, right? And what's going on in your market is we think that rates on the short term are gonna stay down longer than people think. So when I look at, when I was preparing for this discussion today and looking at what's going on in the real estate market in California, in the United States, as foreign investors invest in the market, I found some interesting data, or at least I found a lack of data. And, I, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But what I wanted to highlight was an illiquid market real quick, okay? So I, I don't, who here drinks wine? Everybody drink wine? <laughs> Anybody drink French wine, French red wine? How about buy French Bordeaux futures, anything like that? So what I found was that on the margin, when you actually open up a finite amount of material for a marginal increase in buyers, you have a huge change in the price. Does that make sense? Yes. So what I found was number of Ferraris made doesn't change. Number of muscle cars built in the 1960s hasn't changed. Blue chip cars in general haven't changed as far as the manufacturing goes. But the marginal buyer out of the Middle East, out of South America, out of Asia, one or two percent increase has a massive, massive influence in the price change of those assets. So when we look at it, we can see, and, and unfortunately I couldn't find the data going back, but I've got some, some specific data. It was one of my better trades, I'll tell you about. So back in uh, 2000, I bought some Bordeaux futures of French wine, and they were expensive. Um, 
and I thought they were expensive at the time, so I paid $100 a bottle for a wine that was delivered four years in the future. That same bottle of wine today is worth 35 times what I paid for it in Hong Kong. And what's interesting is I can get two times more in Hong Kong for that same bottle of wine of what I can get for it in the United States. And it just is a minor change in the percentage of the buyer, and it's specifically out of that Asian market and how they perceive French wine. And so when we look at the wine market as well, you can see. But what's really interesting about this, does anybody see some interesting data in here? Anybody? So if you look at what's happened since 2012, we talk about the slowdown that we've seen in Asia, in the Chinese economy specifically. As the Chinese economy has slowed, it's gone from a 10% growth rate. This year, I think people are expecting about a 7.5% is kind of the standard growth rate of the Chinese economy. It's actually going to probably print about 6. Um, you've seen a huge decline. Not a huge decline, but it's a flattening and a little bit of a drop off in those price appreciation. So again, that marginal buyer has gone in that huge swing you haven't seen in the market anymore. And so what I'm, what I'm getting to in this is that when we look at the real estate market in the United States, we look at it in California, and we look at the size of the real estate market, it's a trillion dollar market on an annualized basis. Foreign investors in the US is a very, very small number. But it's amazing the impact that we're seeing in prices, what you're seeing in local communities as it relates to those foreign investors. So we'll kind of get into that. And what we've seen in the United States since the housing starts and how it's recovered since 2008, we're still kind of growing out of that rate. So we're at about a million housing starts. I've got the actual number here. I'll get to that here. So we're running at about a million housing starts on an annualized basis, and that's as of April 1st of this year. Oh, excuse me. So there we go. So we're running at about a million housing starts from the start of this year. And what's interesting in that, and then we look at the percent change in housing starts. And so as we came out of 2008, you saw that percentage change go way up, obviously, there was a complete shutdown in the U.S. housing market. All the home builders completely had massive problems. And so what you saw was a huge decline in housing starts. And then, well, the economy starts picking up again. We're not going to go off the cliff. Things have started to recover, so then housing starts take off. As of yesterday, the data yesterday was we're running about a 12% annualized rate on housing starts. And um, so you're seeing kind of what I would consider to be a normalized rate when we look at the data. So it's, it's recovering. So again, I talk about the US market and what's going on out there. We're looking at about a trillion dollars. But when we look at the international buyers, they're actually a very, very small portion. International buyers, so when we look at 2013 and we look at sales in billions, it's only 34 billion foreign clients with permanent residents outside the United States. So non-US, non-residents buying real estate in the United States is only 34 billion out of a trillion dollar market. Recent immigrants, so green card holders, people that have immigrated to the United States that are non-citizens, non but residents make up another 33 billion. So only 64 billion out of a trillion dollar market when we look at the United States real estate market. So it's actually a very small number. But it's been surprising as we kind of went through the data to look at what's going on on a national basis, what's happened out there. So when we look at what's happened in international clients and how they, what the percentage is of those sales, it's really running about 2%. How many thought it was a much higher number? I, I, I mean, I expected it to be 10% when I started preparing for this and started getting through the data. I expected it to be 10 plus percent. 
At the peak, it was just under 3%. So then we look at what's going on out there and what influences these international buyers and why they buy in the United States. Is you actually have, you know, 21% say U.S. real estate is a secure investment. 27% do it for, you know, the profitable build, profitability of it. 43% say the U.S. is a desirable location. Really what it comes down to, and I've got some other data that I'll show you right at the very end, is that when you think about it, anytime anybody with money that's a non-US citizen, non-resident, has an opportunity to buy United States real estate, they're gonna do it. And I've got some data to show why that's gonna happen and why, oddly enough, Los Angeles may be the cheapest place in the world to buy real estate today. Um, when we look at it from a broader perspective. Why they're not buying, or why individuals that actually try to buy in the United States, why they're not buying, 53%, roughly 53% <coughs> of people that are non-citizens, non-residents, that claim to be looking in the United States. 32% can't get financing. Obviously, credit scores and different things in the United States basically make it impossible. 11% um, can't get access to the United States because of the immigration laws. And 10% actually don't want to subject themselves to U.S. tax laws. So that's actually a very, very small percentage. Um, oddly enough, about 50% claim they couldn't find a property or it was too expensive for them. 31% said they couldn't find it. I would argue that almost across the board, they're not real buyers based on the data that I've seen. And then 18% say cost. I, the only data that I would have that would support why that would that would even make sense from anyone is the percentage of buyers that are in Mexico that are trying to buy in the United States. Because on, an, on a global basis, if you look at where the international buyers are coming from, this is cheaper than anywhere else the buyers are coming from except Mexico. So, I don't know, can anybody actually read this? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we look at it, we say, okay, where are the international buyers coming from? So, where are they coming from? So, basically, what you're seeing here is from 2007 down to 2013, and then across the board, where they come from, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, yada, yada, yada. So what we basically have here is that 24% of the buyers are coming from Asia, 23% are coming from Canada, 8% are coming from Central America, 10% from Europe, and 7% from South America. That's really what, what it comes down to. What we're also seeing, though, is oddly enough, Canada is a massive buyer of U.S. real estate. Canadian citizens, and I can show you exactly where that is. Almost across the board, it's not in California. Um, but when we look at the United States as a whole, Canadian buy there's a lot of Canadian buyers when it comes to United States real estate out there. And then when we look at where they're coming from, they're buying in Arizona, California, Florida, and Texas, right? What's that tell you? They're Canada, and where are they buying? Warm weather. What's interesting, though, and also, you know, California is high tax, but Texas and Florida are low tax states. Um, although Texas is interesting because it's a very high property tax state, so I would almost argue you couldn't play the low tax statement because property taxes in Texas are basically across the board double what they are here in California. So when we look at it, um, what's interesting though to me is the New York number is low. Anybody have any idea why that's so low? It, it's basically one market. It's New York City. So when you think about it, you think about downtown Los Angeles, how many buyers actually, if we were just to look at downtown Los Angeles or even the west side of LA, it's a small number. So it's a geographically, New York City is actually a huge market for foreign investors, but
but on a percentage basis relative to New York as a whole, it's actually a very small number. And so what does the real estate, the international buyer look like and where do they go? All of the data across the board, it's pretty clear where they're coming from. What's really interesting is when we look at New York, even though that number was 3%, you know, you look here, you see New York at 3%, what we see is New York City has got a lot of Europeans. And, and oddly enough, at the very highest end, except for the last couple of months which, with what's going on in Ukraine, is a lot of Russians buying at the very high end of New York City. They're basically setting, except for a couple of hedge fund guys, I think one hedge fund guy last week bought a property in New York for $120 million. Um, a, a Russian, I think about a year and a half ago, had the high watermark in New York City, bought Sandy Wiles' apartment for $100 million. I think it was just under $100 million. I think it was $88 million. And then, uh, nice enough to Sandy, Sandy gave all the money to charity, which was, uh, I guess I'd like to be in that position. But, <laughs> um, but um, also in Florida, what we see in Florida is we see a lot of European money coming into Florida, South Florida. We see a lot of South American money. What's odd is South American money tends to migrate towards Florida. Central American money tends to migrate to Texas and Arizona. And then the Canadians tend to go to Arizona and Texas. And then California is dominated. When we look at the international buyer, California is dominated by the Asian market. It does have some um, Mexican uh, buyers in, in the California market as well. We'll get to that. But what's interesting is it's a very, very small part of the market. But it's having a pretty big impact in prices. And I think you guys see it here as well in, in your local community. So when we look at it, Number of international clients, this is based on National Association of Realtors, so this is on a national basis. How many of their clients are actually international buyers? So you only have a very, very small number of realtors that actually work with international buyers. A very small number of realtors on a national basis do it. So when we look at it, only 4% have had 11 or more international clients. So it's actually a relatively small number. So then when we look at it, basically 8% of realtors have more than half of their transactions with international buyers. So it seems what's, what, what really kind of struck me as odd in this, in this data was that when a realtor started working with the international network or with international buyers, it, it became a pretty big number pretty quickly. So when you look at it, when you actually start to look at it, it jumps up quite a bit because basically when you're looking at it, it's almost 70% of the market or, you know, 75% of the market does less than 10% of their business with international buyers. But the percent that do work with international buyers tend to work with a lot of international buyers. And then that goes back to, well then, it, those few that do work with international buyers, how are they finding them? Almost across the board, 18% through, through friends. 26% through previous clients or contacts. 2% through um, international referral sources. 8% through other domestic referral sources. So I would say that's still a referral. So when I look at it, I start to look at the data and I say, well, you know, 50 plus 60%, you know, 50 to 60% of it is basically who you know. But in the real estate business, just like in the investment industry, isn't that everything? It's a large part of it. I mean, who do you know? Do you do a good job with your clients? Do you get the referrals? And that's a very big part of that business. It's even more so when you start looking at it on an international basis. You know, when you're dealing with clients, whether it's in South America, Central America, Asia, do you speak the language? Do you know the local culture? Do you interact? 
with that demographic and in that community in locally so that you can translate to that local custom and lo that local contact on an international basis. So when, what we find is that across the board, that's what's happening. So we look at then from an international basis, let's start drilling down a little bit and looking at what's going on out there um, and what's going on out there in the marketplace. California housing starts are continuing to move up. The biggest problem that we see in California with the home builders is they, they're, they're struggling to buy land. So when we look at housing starts, they, they're really struggling to buy land. And so what this is, is this is number of housing applications actually approved, okay? And the most current data is that there's been, you know, April of 2014, in the month of April, there were 8,623 approved. What's interesting though is how many actually started construction. Does anybody have any idea how that's changed? It's actually a, a, there's a big spread in this number. So the actual starts of single family home units that will be privately owned, Q1 of this year was only 2,800 homes. So there's not that much supply coming on market when we look at what's going on out there. And so when you look at the percent change in units approved, again, so what we're looking at is how many have been approved and how many have actually started. This is actually percent change in approved. That number is you know, continuing to come down. Right now, again, it's, a, it's an issue of them having struggling to find land, the new home builders. And so we've actually got 13.6 is the current number that we're seeing, and that's April. So it's actually a little bit of an uptick from the current number that you're seeing up on the screen, which is kind of the mid single digits. It's actually, as of April, it's about 6%. So then when we look at what's going on out there, I wanted to put this in context a little bit. So again, the international buyer and how that translates to the California real estate market is what does the immigration environment look like in the state of California? So persons obtaining personal, you know, permanent residence in the United States, basically green card holders, only 196,000 were admitted to the United States in, in uh, California in 2012. It's a very small percentage. When we look at 23 million people in California, and you think about 196,000 total immigrants, I'm not talking about home buyers. I'm just talking about sheer number of people that actually were documented. It's, it's, it's a low number. Then we look at people that have actually been naturalized. So people that are foreigners, born outside the United States, came to the United States, got a green card, and now they've actually become naturalized citizens of the United States. It's another 158,000 in 2012. So you're still dealing with a relatively small number when we look at what's going on in the United States. So when we look at it, so that was the total number there, 158. So then we actually start to break it down a little bit and we look at where that, that number came from. You can see that 107,000 came from Asia, which is a large part of the population of the immigrants in the United States. But what was interesting is if we actually dig into it a little bit more, North America shows 32%. So if we actually break it down a little bit more and actually stop talking about continents or regions and actually start looking at what countries the citizens come from, amazingly, Mexico was actually the highest actual number. So Mexican um, immigrants into California was 49,595 in 2012. What was the second biggest country? Anybody have a guess? It's what, it's what everybody across the board would guess, right? It, it was the Philippines. Twice, by 60 people. The, the Philippines beat out China by 60 people. The Philippines was 22,484. China was 22,000. 424. 
So it actually was a, it was pretty amazing. But it, but when we look, you know, so when you see Asia is 55 percent, well, Asia is a big place, right? That's let's talk about where they're actually coming from um, across the board. And so when we look at the environment out there, there's a lot of Asian immigrants, not just Chinese immigrants, into California. So then we actually look at okay, well, so then what does the home ownership rate look like? of foreigners as well as U.S. citizens. So what you're actually seeing here is you're seeing the far left, the far left of the screen is born in the U.S. or abroad, center is naturalized, and the far right is not a U.S. citizen, not involved. You know, so what we're seeing here is U.S. citizens 57% home ownership in California, 66% across the United States. So home ownership rates in California are a little bit lower when you're a citizen of the U.S. That's common, right? I mean, home, everybody would expect that, right? Housing prices in California are across the board, right? And the same thing happens when we look at naturalized citizens. Is 61% in California, 65% across the United States as a whole. And then not a U.S. citizen, so green card holders, people that are, you know, here in California, it's 27%. In California, 33% in the U.S. Really, nothing to learn from this except to say that California is more expensive than the rest of the country, so home ownership rates are down. Well, I don't know about you, but I would have expected that, right? So then when we look at, okay, who are the actual buyers of housing in the United States, in California? Again, you know, Asia's 54%. Well, I think we already came to that assumption based on where the, where the immigrants are coming from. A large portion are Asia as a whole. Um, and then we also looked at those own ownership rates and what's going on out there. So all the data shows us that's where California is seeing foreign buyers coming from. But what's interesting is we are seeing about 16% from Europe. You're seeing a little bit from Canada, a little bit from Latin America and the Caribbean. But basically, the foreign ownership of California real estate is clearly dominated by the Asian buyer. But you go into certain markets and certain regions of California as a whole, what you tend to find is pockets based on different demographics, cultural background, um, family history, different things like that. So when you go in certain areas of Orange County, you've got you know large Persian populations in Orange County. West side of Los Angeles, you got large Persian population. You got a large Jewish population on the west side of Los Angeles. Inland Empire, we've got large Asian populations here. We've got it, you tend to find pockets where the numbers are drastically different. And so when I look at my data and I look at what's going on on the national basis, and then when I even drill down to California as a whole, real estate's local. And so when you look at changes in real estate values, um, I know we went through a national real estate recession in 2008, but in the history of the United States, that's the first time that's ever happened. Basically, when you look at it, you know, across the board, real estate is local when we look at what's going on out there. So then we look at preferences of where different buyers are investing in California. So when we look at the home Chinese market, where are they buying? 53% of the Chinese buyers that come to the United States, 53% are buying in California. And I mean, it just basically blows everything else away. 29%, I don't know if you can read it, well, that's other. There's 45 other states. So that's, it, it's by far the Chinese buyers buying in California. What they're also buying is, you know, the bar chart looks is misleading. It looks like they're buying all single family homes based on the spread. It's only 52%. It's, that, that bar chart should be, you know, the National Association of Realtors gave us this data. It's a, it, it's, it should be more equal. They're buying townhomes, condos, apartment buildings. It's almost equal. They're buying across the board in California. And then basically, almost 70% of the Chinese buyer in California is paying all cash. Again, it, 
It's a little bit misleading to me. I think that blue should be much bigger in that section of the, of the portfolio. And then what's also interesting is it, it's, it's tough to really understand what it's telling you, but central city urban is 40%, suburban is 50%. Well, to me, that says 92% of the buyer is buying around the city center. I mean, if somebody disagrees with me, I, I'd love to hear it, but basically it's telling me they're buying in Los Angeles, they're buying in San Jose, San Francisco, they're buying in major city centers in the suburb, suburban market. So when we look at what's going on in California real estate, even though I just told you it's a very small percentage, they're having a big impact in very specific areas. So then what happens in housing starts when we look at what's going on out there? Check the time. I'm, I don't want to run out of time here. Aren't you? <laughs> so we look at what's going on in LA. Housing starts you know, are continuing to move up in LA. But the percent change is coming down. Well, of course it's coming down. It's not going to, you, you've only got a finite amount of space. You can only build so many homes. We're not going to overbuild. We don't have the space unless we go vertical in this, in this part of the country. Um, and so what you're seeing out there is the percent is coming down, but it's still growing. And so there's a lot of data on here. So what we're actually seeing is basically across the board, top left-hand corner, what you're seeing is this is Anaheim, uh, Santa Ana, Orange County. What you're seeing is across the board, historically, it's a lot more expensive than the broader United States. Well, of course it is, right? What you're seeing down below that is non-farm employment in the Anaheim region compared to the United States. So they've mirrored each other pretty well. But what I found interesting is we did see a pretty big decline in housing prices in that market. Um, basically, it coincided with what happened in the national economy. And obviously, without question, is it a surprise to anybody that home affordability in Orange County is low? It's expensive, right? It's a tough place to be. What's also interesting, though, is housing permits starts, or it's tough, there, there's not a lot of space there. So you just don't see a lot of houses being built. I know inland of Orange, that inland side, right as you kind of cross into the Inland Empire, Riverside County, places like that, it, you know, you do start to see some space there, but when you, especially when you start looking at coastal Orange County, what's going on out there, it's, um, it, there's not a lot of space. Same thing holds true when we look at what's going on in the Los Angeles market. It's a very, very similar thing. What was also interesting, and, and this is probably a good place to bring it up, um, is what I found when I started looking at the decline. So when we look at it, so we look at the decline in 2008 in Orange County. We look at the decline in Los Angeles in 2008. What's interesting is the LA Long Beach market hasn't appreciated as a whole at the same rate that Orange County has recovered. But LA is a bigger market. It's a more diverse market. So it makes sense to me, at least based on the data, that it wouldn't recover as fast. There's pockets of Los Angeles that are at new all-time highs, but there's other pockets that have not recovered as fast. It's a more diverse market. What's interesting, though, is so when we look at the recession and what happened in 2008, what percentage of mortgages actually went into foreclosure? Anybody know? Any ideas? Thirty percent of, of mortgages went into foreclosure in the recession. Yeah, like a little more. What's that? Probably twenty. Yeah. Twenty. This and this, and because housing prices declined, what would everybody agree? Housing decline prices declined what twenty to thirty percent. Certain areas more, certain areas less, but let's just say 25% if we were to pick a number. So we'd assume foreclosures were 25%, right? This is how big of an impact a small change can have. National foreclosure rate in um, 2007, because it was a, a national recession, was 2.04% in Q4 of 2007. At the height of the recession, Q1 of 2009, national foreclosure rate, 
It's 3.85 percent. December 31 of 2010, as we're still the the economy's recovering, but housing hasn't yet. The peak on a national basis was 4.64 percent. It's a very small number when you start looking at how many people really went into that foreclosure and how many people had problems. So when we then look at where we were in California, so let's look at it a little bit differently. Let's look at foreclosures and let's look at how many people are past due. Q4 of 2009. Past due foreclosure, whatever you want to call it, people that aren't paying their mortgage. What's the number in California? Any idea? Point two. It's 11%. Still a small number. When you think about people that are past due, so greater than 30 days past due, people that aren't paying their mortgage, it's a small number. The U.S. national average was only 10.5%. And I know I see some skeptical faces out there, so if somebody has some other data, I'd be happy to look at it. But the data I found, that's what it was. Um, December 31, 2012, as we're recovering, 6% in California was past due, which was, oddly enough, lower than the national average in the United States, which was over 7%, which tells me that, you, that California was recovering at a much faster pace People were doing better. Housing was appreciating faster, recovering faster. People caught up on their mortgages. This is the Riverside data again. And, and what was interesting in Riverside was you saw that massive spike in home values in Riverside in that 2007, 2008 time frame. What was odd was the Riverside market, San Bernardino County, mimicked the U.S. Across the, across the board prior to the big boom in the 06, 07 time frame, and it's mimicked it since then. What I also found really odd, and honestly I didn't have time to figure out what the data was telling me, but I found it very odd that non-farm employees in Riverside basically didn't move during the recession. It, it's, it's a strange phenomenon. I got i got to dig into why that was, but um, I, I don't know if it was just the size of the market was small, but it's interesting to see that housing prices went way up and came back down, but non-farm employees basically were flat. So then we look at, well, what's the affordability of California and what goes on out there in the marketplace? This is all the data for the home value comparative cost to California versus the rest of the country. Well. We all know that it's expensive. Medium, but income is also higher. So medium household income for California is 58,000. US as a whole was only 51,000. Home value though, medium home value was 349,000 in California versus 171,000 in the US as a whole. So the cost of ownership with the mortgage in California was $2,100 a month versus the U.S. national average was only $1,400. Cost of owning a home in California is more expensive. Well, that's not a surprise. What I found most surprising, though, was the income versus home value. Basically, what, what scares me when I look at that is, you know, a lot of leverage, right? I don't know about everybody else, but we all got to take out, or at least I had to take out a big mortgage to get a house in California when I moved here from Texas six years ago. I, and, I, and I'm basically, if I'm buying, don't buy. That's the peak. I bought in spring of 2006, almost the height of the market. <laughs> I think maybe I may be, may be flat at this point. <laughs> But a lot of lost hair and heartache in between that. <laughs> so when we look at what's going on out there in, in, in the market and what, what the uh, mortgage market looks like, um, you know, the conventional loans have gone down. FHA insured home, home loans have gone way up since the 2007 through the recession. So 
Conventional has gone down. FHA insured has gone way up. Um, VA insured has gone way up in California as well. So when we look at it in 2007, you know, total number was um, you know less than 3,000. Now it's basically running 7,000. Um, so when we look at it, uh, you know, insured home mortgages FHA has has gone up. It's down from the 09 peak, um, and that's obviously a change in the way lenders are pricing things. And now, does everybody remember I said California is probably the cheapest market in the world to buy? So I kind of walked through everything. Let me show you why. So this is price per square foot, and I looked at global cities across the board. So when I look at the data, it was pretty shocking. I knew Los Angeles on a relative basis to major city centers around the world was low. What I'm surprised at is how low it actually is, even compared to other markets. You know, the Hong Kong number I think is tough to, to get your hands around. It's a it's a small amount of space. You got a lot of foreigners. It, it's it's a tough number, and my data may be wrong on that. So it's a, it's a high number. It's showing eleven thousand. Tokyo's showing seventy six hundred square foot. I know London is pretty accurate at about fifty three hundred square foot. I know Paris is is pretty accurate. I actually think Moscow is actually higher than the data I'm showing. Moscow's showing forty three hundred square foot. Um, I actually think based on some of the data that I had um, before I pulled this um, was actually higher than that. I know it sounds strange to think of it, but Moscow is by far definitely one of the top two or three most expensive cities in the world to live in. Mm -hmm. New York um, is 4,100 a square foot. New York is, is crazy expensive when we look at New York City. Um, Shanghai is 2100 square foot. Singapore is showing 1820 a square foot. Um, I would actually probably argue that that number should be a lot higher. And when I look at total cost of living, Singapore, I would, I would probably argue, you may be tough to find a place more expensive in the world to live than Singapore. You know, I, I, my, I joined U.S. Trust in September of last year. One of my partners at the firm that I was at before was uh, Singaporean and he had to get a uh, license to buy a car because he wanted to buy a car. And the license to buy the car cost him $200,000 in Singapore. That's it. But that was before he bought the car. So then he had to buy the car on top of it. That was just the right to buy the car cost him two hundred dollars <laughs> no, no, regardless of what kind of car you get. A Bentley Rose? Doesn't matter what kind of car you get. It was 200 grand. Wow. You can only drive it for 10 years. Yeah. So, um, Mumbai showing 970 square foot. Sid Sydney is showing 880 square foot. San Francisco is showing 660 a square foot. That's low. It, it, well, and it depends on what you're counting as San Francisco, right? Because of the tech. I mean, you've got bidding prices going on in San Francisco. San Francisco is a tough market to get data on. San Francisco is a market like Los Angeles. Well, I can tell you the west side of Los Angeles is not $348 a square foot. Coastal Orange County, Newport Beach is not $348 a square foot. No, I mean, it's, it's anywhere from 600 to 800 a square foot. But when we look at it as a whole, and when we look at why are foreign buyers coming to the United States and buying? Why are the China, and when we look at it, let's be blunt, the data says there's a lot of Chinese buyers coming into the United States and buying. Why are they coming? When you look at, take away certain pockets of the market, they're buying here because on a relative basis relative to the rest of the world, it is inexpensive. You've got a lot of security, in U.S. real estate, oddly, I know that people want to bash the U.S. dollar. You've got a lot of security in the U.S. dollar. And what's going on on a, on a global basis right now, you probably have more security in the U.S. dollar than you have in any other currency on a global basis right now. And the likelihood of the U.S. dollar appreciating over the next couple of years versus the euro 
and versus the Chinese yuan and versus the yen, the likelihood of the US dollar appreciating is huge. When you look at what's going on in the rest of the economies around the world, so we'll actually translate out of real estate and where we are going forward in the economy. The United States is doing exceptionally well. So when we look at it, well, let's talk about let's talk about future expectations of real estate real quick. I'm almost out of time actually, so we may not get to economic expectations. The one this is one of the charts that scares me. <clears throat> so this is what's going on in the in lumber market in the futures market. This is what builds houses, right? We're in the spring selling season. Things should be booming. This, this does concern me. The US economy is doing well. Housing seems to be recovering. Why are lumber futures declining? Hey, honestly, I don't, I don't have an answer to that. But this is one of the things, when I look at the US housing market on a national basis, what concerns me? This concerns me more than anything else. So existing home sales, this is very recent data of where the trends are. So we went through where we've been, where we're going is existing home sales can on future expectations. So then again, this is the futures market. This is what's going on on Bloomberg. This is what's going on in my world in the, when we're trading financial futures. So we go through lumber, it's, it's rolled over. Future expectations for housing, it's not looking that great. Housing starts and building permits has continued to move up. So that's, you know, we went through a long period of that recession and it is doing better. But these, are, these two numbers are really strange to me. So new home sales, it, you know, it, when we look at new home sales, it's a, you know, they're all over the map every single month. To me, it's a lot of no, noise. What I do see there is a trend that new home sales have gotten better. They're not going through the roof. When I look at what's going on out there, new home sales, the big issue is the home builders have been behind the curve. When we look at what's happened with home builders, when we look at new home sales, they've been behind the curve. When we look at all the data and I talk to the home builders on what's going on, their biggest problem last year was they didn't have enough homes to sell. But then why is this number still going down? It's, and that's what's strange to me. Can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. I just recently took a class in green um, certification and they spoke about materials that are coming up mm -hmm. that are not wooden. Would that have any... That would be such a small part of the market that I don't even... You know, I know that some people are using metal. Um, I don't know what else they would be using yet. I mean, I, you know, again, and that would be a new home construction. Um, it, it's just, that it's a small number. And I just don't know. But we just talked about how big of an impact small numbers can have. I still think it's less than 1%. I think this is future expectations. I just don't think we're there yet. So when we look at, okay, well, what's going on? This is the case Shiller price index. This is what goes on with, you know, what's the 20 city composite house housing looking? It's been a little flat. It's up, I think yesterday the data was it was up 12% year over year. So it's still continuing to accelerate, still doing well. What I don't like about this is this is probably the single most lagging indicator out there. Does anybody know how it's calculated? So it's basically the average of the prior four months of closed contracts. Well, the, average, the prior four months, that means that we're looking at data from January when we look at what was just reported yesterday. I would imagine you guys are much more active in the market and you're, what happened in January isn't relevant today to you. What happened last month may be, but that's only a quarter of the number. So look, I know, um, I know we're, I'm actually out of time, so I gotta wrap up here. But a percentage of refinances, Back in 2008, 2009, it was almost 100% of the market. 
when we look at what's going on today, we're in a more normalized environment to some degree. It's only half of the market are refinances. So it's a relatively you know, uh, modest number. So when we look at what's going on out there, percent of refinances to new applications, half of the, half the market is still refinances. As rates continue to stay down low, I mean, you just basically refi everybody that could get refi, right? I mean, I don't know, there's not that many people left. So, new mortgage applications, again, you know, the biggest challenge that we have is qualifying for mortgages out there um, across the, the United States. So, new mortgage applications. Rates went up um, over the last couple of months. 10-year treasury is now at 244. Expectations is that, you know, rates would start to come down a little bit in here as long as the 10-year continues to decline. You know, there's nothing that says that the rates wouldn't kind of coincide with that, but a little bit on a lagging basis. So where are we in the United States economy? Real quick, do I have two minutes? All right, where are we? So we're in what, what I would call the mid-cycle. So the U.S. economy runs through a sine wave, right? We go through early expansion, late expansion, early contraction, late contraction. We're basically in between early and late expansion in the U.S. economy right now. And what you're seeing happen is we've seen a lot of churn in the stock market. Everybody's been talking about market declines, this, that, and the other. We actually hit all-time highs yesterday on the S&P. But we're basically flat right now. You're seeing a lot of churn and a lot of rotation within the market as we sit as these highs. The best place to invest in early expansion is highly levered balance sheets, high growth companies. As you move into late expansion and start to roll over into early contraction as the economy starts to mature, you want companies with more cash on the balance sheet, more free cash flow, higher dividends, more stable companies. What's interesting is over the last couple of months, you've seen biotech stocks get absolutely slaughtered. Healthcare stocks like J&J are still sitting at all time highs. That's what I'm talking about is you move from early expansion to late expansion, you see that rotation within the market. So what does that mean for a US investor, whether it's real estate or different things? <laughs> We're always behind, right? <laughs> you got to be a psychologist, right? So right now where people are cautious, but cautiously optimistic, right? They're, you know, they're feeling good about things. When they're in contempt, that was the time to buy, right? So that's kind of it. Um, I know I'm out of time. Any other questions? I appreciate all the time today. Any questions? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, there was, was a lot of information given by Mr. Christopher Andrew, and let's give him another big round of applause. All right. It gives me a great pleasure and also honor to introduce our next uh, distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Lincoln Stone. Uh, Mr. Lincoln Stone is an attorney with Stone, Gregory, and Gonzalez in the Los Angeles, and they have a long law firm with 20 immigration attorney, and Lincoln has overseen the growth of the law firm, where it has been recognized by Fortune and the inner city 100 program as one of the fastest growing inner city small businesses in America. Lincoln is one of the five certified specialist in immigration and nationality law. State Bar of California is regarded by his peers and attorney, such as the best lawyers in America as one of the premier practitioner in the field of immigration law. Mr. Lincoln has successfully represented more than 2,500 clients and an unprecedented number of clients for removal of condition in the EB-5 investor visa category. Dozens of his uh, U.S. business clients have raised nearly $3 billion for more than 80 different job-creating enterprises through the EB-5 investor visa program. Mr. Lincoln, unparalleled experience of more than 20 years 
include complex problem resolution and litigation of GB5 investor cases. Mr. Lincoln holds the degrees of Jewish Doctor, Master of Arts in Humanities, and Bachelor of Business Administration. And Lincoln's legal training includes the University of Notre Dame Law School, a federal court clerkship with the Honorable Robert A. Grant, prior attorney experiences with the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service, private practice experience in domestic and international business transaction, and litigation in state and federal court, and more than 22 years of immigration law practice. So please help me welcome our Mr. <coughs> Stop, Lincoln Stone. Thank you, Mr. Shu. I appreciate that very much. Uh, my name is Lincoln Stone. You may call me Lincoln. Uh, you may call me a lot of things after this. But, uh, <laughs> um, that was very kind. The I hope we'll follow this uh, PowerPoint, uh, but I want to tell you right from the start, if you have questions along the way, you save them. I'm going to try to uh, save about 15 minutes at the end so you can ask me whatever questions you want to ask. Hopefully it'll be about the topic that I present, <laughs> but maybe you have questions about other things. Uh, I want to thank uh, my longtime friend Eddie Chow. I, I see him in the back of the room he, for uh, introducing me to this group, uh, your association. I'm very impressed with the facility and everybody here uh, eager to learn. Uh, about some complex materials that are presented today. And uh, thank you to the associate for having me. I, um, that was a generous introduction, but really I rely tremendously on about 50 people in our law firm, uh, including uh, about 20 other immigration lawyers. Immigration law is the only thing we practice. We're in downtown Los Angeles. Two of my colleagues are here, uh, partners, uh, Elsie, we, audience, go ahead and stand up, please, Elsie. <laughs> and uh, Eileen Chung Frucho. <laughs> and, um, you know, really, if I didn't have lawyers like them working in my office, it would be um, a rid ridiculous fiasco, and my wife would have made me retire a long time ago. Now, what I want to talk about today is just one small aspect of immigration practice. I'm sure you know um, immigration law runs A to Z. We can have immigration by way of family uh, relationships, immigration by way of asylum, immigration by way of job sponsorship. But what I want to talk about today is just investment. And in the larger scheme of things, Investment is just a small niche area of practice in, in, in the immigration field. And in fact, in our law firm, we have, among the 20 or so lawyers, we have people doing really the full A to Z. Now, Elsie is one lawyer who uh, has to work with me, unfortunately for her, almost every day in this area of what we call EB-5 immigration. And just by way of a slight contrast, Eileen, we work together in the area of small business immigration or startup companies and emerging businesses that are usually uh, sponsoring uh, immigrants by way of uh, job sponsorship. But EB-5 immigration, maybe some of you have heard of this. And why is it called EB-5 immigration? It's because it's, called, it's the employment-based fifth preference category of immigration as opposed to EB-1 or EB-2 or EB-3. Uh, I can see that we have a little bit of a, a problem with the spacing here. I don't know why it's cutting off on the left-hand margin on the PowerPoint, uh, but it uh, looks like the left-hand margin's cut off. So EB-5 immigration is employment-based fifth preference and it involves nothing more really than the simple concept an immigrant invests in a U.S. business that's going to lead to U.S. permanent residence. And I want to clarify something right from the start. Business, U.S. business, not 
merely U.S. real estate. There is no provision that provides for U.S. immigration benefits based solely on investment in a piece of real estate here in the United States. Typically, all benefits based on investment in the United States that may concern real estate as an asset are going to require this demonstration of a business enterprise. Now, EB-5 immigration in particular is unique in the sense that it provides at the outset what we call conditional residence. So at the conclusion of say a year or a year and a half of the application process, the investor and the investor's family will be able to come to the US with the so-called green card or permanent residence. But what is very important is that it's conditional for two years. This creates a, a great deal of uncertainty because at the end of that two year period, this investor is going to have to file another petition to demonstrate to, to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service that certain conditions have been satisfied. And if those conditions have not been satisfied, that it's possible that the investor will, could be subject to immigration court proceedings where the government seeks to deport them. So because EB-5 immigration involves conditional residence for at least the first two years, it is very smart uh, before embarking on the pathway of EB-5 immigration to consider what other alternatives might be available to this individual before they embark on this pathway. There are histories, sad stories, about families getting stuck in this conditional residence. And these are, some, some of these stories could have been avoided, maybe at the outset, had there been more appreciation for other alternatives that could have been available to a family. So we like to say in our law firm, even though EB-5 immigration is a huge part of our immigration practice, we need to go through this checklist of one, two, three, four, and five, consider other alternatives before a, a client goes down the pathway of EB-5 immigration. Okay, now, EB-5 eligibility requirements. They're not that difficult uh, on, on the face. It requires investment, and we're looking for $1 million, or in many cases, the minimum is $500,000. The investment must be in a new commercial enterprise. The investors will need to show that the capital used to invest in the business is from a lawful source. The capital must be at risk. Each investor who's petitioning for immigration must show that the investment in the business will create at least 10 jobs. And there's a management participation requirement. That's all that's required. If you understand these things, you can be, you can be an EB-5 lawyer if you want. Like you're probably better off doing what you've been doing. So <laughs> let's just look at a few of these. You know, the more important ones, obviously, the investment amount. $1 million is the amount required by law, but a lot of EB-5 investors actually are uh, proving their eligibility at the lower threshold of $500,000. And what is required? Well, the investor needs to show that the investment will be in the new commercial enterprise that is doing business principally in an area that is either rural or that is high unemployment. Now, in Southern California, of course, we're not talking about businesses in rural areas. We're talking mostly about businesses that are principally doing business in a high unemployment area. And you can get some interesting results. Um, some critics of the program have uh, claimed that this aspect of the law has been abused. You know, projects in somewhat uh, relatively better off areas or qualifying as high unemployment areas. And all I can say about that is uh, it's a very transparent process. There's a lot of regulation. You can actually combine census tracts, you know, a collection of seven, eight census tracts, and prove that the business is in a high unemployment area. It's a little complex because it involves economic analysis about where the, where the employees are all traveling from. And so on its face, you can't just dismiss something as not qualifying 
for a lower $500,000 minimum. Why is that important? Well, because most of the market for raising money in the EB-5 category is at the lower $500,000 range, and it makes sense. Why would an investor invest twice as much if they can invest at the 500,000 level and get the same kind of green card permanent residence. The second thing worth talking about is at some length is the investor capital must come from a lawful source. You know, everybody hates this. Nobody likes it. Uh, a lot of clients come to us and say, you know, I have a clean record. I've got all my tax returns and I have this and that. And we still put them through a long, arduous process of showing all kinds of documentation about how they got their money. This seems to me, you know, our firm, I've done close to 3,000 of these cases. And I just don't know that there's ever been an easy one. And nobody likes this process. They end up hating their lawyer at the end of it. <laughs> but it's absolutely necessary because when we file those cases, um, I think the government has some institutional knowledge that our law firm puts forth some strong cases. And that we're not just, uh, no, putting forth a skimpy, thin file. And so, uh, always a difficult thing. Now, to capital at risk is, is interesting. Um, and this goes to, let's just say, for example, you, you're representing a developer who wants to develop some real estate here somewhere in the Southland, and the developer gets this crazy idea of raising EB-5 capital to help fund some huge development and all these things come together and it looks like you're gonna be able to raise all this capital, but there's one issue here that needs to be addressed and, that, and I'll just address this in terms of timing. If you are raising capital for something that is just kind of a, an idea or the, say the developer has a plan to buy a, a piece of dirt, but it's really you know, several years of entitlements and nothing's really going to happen for the next four or five years. And you're going to raise whatever, $50 million from 100 foreign investors to help buy this asset and to develop it into something that would be some material operating business. If not much has happened in the way of making all that happen in, uh, in the business plan, the Immigration Service will say, well, the capital is not really at risk. Nothing's going to happen. That money is just going to sit around for the next couple of years. So, in this, what I'm trying to point out here is that sometimes it's just the timing is important. This is not yet ripe for an EB5 project. The 10 jobs per investor is, is a key focus of the program. The USCIS has spent a lot of time on this in the last few years. And it's enough to say, number one, creating 10 jobs in the future is usually what we're looking for. But in some cases, the new commercial enterprise may satisfy what we call the rule of troubled business. If the, if the company has lost money over the last few years and that loss exceeds a certain amount of, it, of its former net worth, then this could be a troubled business. In that case, the investor can qualify for immigration based on saving the jobs that are there as opposed to creating them in the future. Uh, the standard case, though, is based on creating jobs and on the proof that the people who will be working there will be employees of the business in which the investor invests. This is a complicating factor for a lot of real estate-oriented enterprises. So in other words, you, you say, well, I'm gonna buy all this real estate, and then we're gonna hire a bunch of people to help manage it, and we're gonna provide uh, all kinds of management services. Well, the problem is, you need to have at least 10 employees for the business in which people invest in order to satisfy the EB-5 eligibility requirements. And of course, in property management, most of the people working on properties, they're all independent contractors. Now, there's an exception to what I just said, and that is where investment is in a business that's tied to what we call a regional center. When we're talking about investment with a regional center arrangement, all of a sudden, the investor has the additional advantage of using proof of indirect job creation throughout the economy. We expand the job creation concept 
outside of just the business in which you invest, and, and we get to count through economic analysis all the job creating impacts throughout the economy. And there, we get to capture all those construction related and real estate oriented type job creation. So that is why most of the time in EV5 practice, we're talking about regional center affiliated uh, investment. So I'm gonna go through some numbers real quickly. Uh, you know, the, this law has been around since 1990. Congress enacted it in 1990 as part of a large omnibus immigration act and allocated 10,000 of these as annually. And just to give you some sense for how little the program was used, and I'll show you a graph on the next slide. 10 years ago, only 126 total visas were issued for this program. Visas, a family on average, maybe three or four people. That means there are 30 or 40 cases for the year that were approved. Now, 10 years later, in the current fiscal year, all 10,000 visas are going to be exhausted, it looks like, before the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30. Why is that? The combination over the last four or five years, global recession, you all know about that, credit markets, problems, you know that, China's wealth, you probably are aware of that, and the regional centers that I mentioned. Well, what about these regional centers? What they do is groups in the United States, they form together, they put together a plan, they said, we wanna raise capital to promote development and investment in a certain geographic area of the United States. They file an application with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, ask for approval. In 2004, there were less than 10 of those regional centers. Now, in 2014, there are close to or even more than 500 regional centers. Meaning, 500 groups, or maybe a few less than that because many groups have multiple regional centers throughout the United States. So let's just say conservatively 400 groups are out looking for these investors for their investment projects in the United States. Now I'm gonna show you some charts real quickly and, and my, uh, I have to throw this out there. These charts are a courtesy of the Association to Invest in the USA and there's their website. And this is an organization that has really grown rapidly in the last five years. And, um, does great service for the industry. Okay, it's not big enough to see, but if you have a close monitor, the idea with this first graph is, and this is based on petitions, by the way. So if you look at the year 2004, you can see it, it barely notices mention that there were just you know, a, a few petitions approved. And then all the way to the right side, Fiscal year 2013, we're well above 3,000 petitions. And again, that's why we're approaching that 10,000 visa cap in this current fiscal year. So what else does this show? The red is that these are the China nationals who are getting these visas. You see the red? They didn't really merit any mention 10 years ago. But look 10 years later. They're 86% of all the visa usage. And shown differently in this pie chart, um, in the time frame, on the left hand side, time frame of 1992 to 2008 in total, China registered about 21% of the approved petitions. And here on the right hand side, just in the last uh, four to five fiscal years, this is through 2013, 75% of all the approvals over a four to five year period. Now these next few pie charts, they relate to other countries, you know, other than China. And, uh, and you can see on the left hand side of note, Taiwan from 1992 to 2008 was a significant player in the EV5 field, about 40% or so of all petitions approved in the EB-5 category from the, the earlier period. And that's a, uh, over a 15, 16 year period. Not counting China and South Korea. Then you look at the right hand side and you can see that Taiwan at the top with the royal blue color, much less of a factor, about 10%. And then around the right hand side of that, um, 
that pie chart, you'll see some five other countries that seem to be growing in significance. Those are Iran, India, Mexico, Venezuela, and Russia. That's where, other than China, that's where a lot of the, the current investors are coming from, these other countries. And you can think, you'll go through one by one, and you can imagine why. You know, there are some push factors going on in countries like Russia, Venezuela, Mexico, Iran. Uh, this, again, <coughs> concerns countries other than, other than China, and I'm going to speed through these, and maybe your association can make this PowerPoint available to all of you, you can look at it later, but this first chart involves uh, South Korea, Taiwan, United Kingdom, and Iran, and I'm going to let you look at that later. This next chart shows other countries, <laughs> India, Mexico, Venezuela, and Russia. And then the last of these is Canada, Japan, Vietnam, Brazil. I selected these for the reason that, uh, you know, for people who are looking for foreign investment, who foreign investors who are interested in immigration, it's, it's helpful to know you're not limited just to the mainland Chinese investors. And also that's significant because the way U.S. immigration law is written presently, there is a per country cap on immigration. So China, people from China who are investing for immigration benefits, they have not only the cap of 10,000 visas per year, which is a limiting factor, but they also have a per country cap on China immigration as a whole. So it behooves one who's trying to raise capital through the EB-5 program to be thinking about maybe some other countries as well. And so I have, uh, you have some charts you can look at about uh, you know, eight to 10 other countries that may be good sources. So I'm, I don't know why these uh, slides aren't fitting right, but <laughs> we can, we can, we can kind of figure out what they are. We can kind of, okay, so, uh, and I'm not the IT person, so. Um, so I just listed a few of the the EB-5 projects that our law firm has been involved in. And by the way, there's no, there no promotion here of any particular project. These are all, all fully funded. And uh, I just picked the ones that are here in California and that I can think of. So, um, late, at the, late at night that I can think of. So, the, the first one there is Los Angeles, obviously, downtown. Uh, it's actually LA Live that I was thinking of. Oh that I was thinking of LA Live, and um, hotel construction, $168 million raised through uh, EB-5 Capital for a ground up construction, a Marriott courtyard residence in a combined property with a common um, lobby. $168 million for 376 uh, total rooms, and I think their grand opening is actually like like this week or next week, and it's right on Olympic, on the periphery of uh, LA Live, right across the street from JW Marriott. Um, uh, we got it, sorry. Five dollars. <laughs> it's a client. <laughs> the, yeah, no kidding. The, um, we'll just skip uh, the next, just to, so we can move on here, uh, Buena Park. Another ground up construction, a uh, retail project, and through, let's just say, five or six different offerings, $150 million <coughs> raised uh, for 450,000 square feet of uh, retail on a huge, huge space in Buena Park. Uh, it's a beach corner store intersection. Uh, the next one, Inglewood Racetrack Development, you probably have heard of Hollywood Park. Um, $188 million of EB-5 capital going into the first phase of redevelopment. Um, Riverside is the next one listed there. Um, the Rice, Rice Solar Energy Project, uh, at least for our involvement, $65 million. Uh, it's, a, it's in Blythe actually, um, for utility-scale solar project. Um, 
Another utility scale solar project, the San Bernardino, the Ivanpah solar project, $90 million of EB5 capital there. Um, but it's not, uh, I don't see it here, but San Bernardino, EB5 capital has been heavily used for redevelopment of the Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino. And I'm gonna just, uh, several different partnerships, I'll just uh, estimate about $50 million for different infrastructure improvements there at the, at the base. And then it's not all about um, real estate oriented projects necessarily. I just give you the example up in the Fresno area, about $48 million for um, manufacturing scissor lift type product in, in that area. All with EB5 capital. Now, let me go through this. Uh, in the things I just mentioned, some of them follow the first model at the top, and some of them follow uh, the model at the, the bottom, and let's, let's go through that quickly. The, um, what we call a single group model, um, we might consider that more like corporate finance, and that is where the EV5 investors are investing along with the U.S. Um, side promoters and developers and, and a, usually a pure equity position. And so that Marriott that I mentioned downtown, it follows this first single group model. Um, the Marriott up in Seattle for one of our clients, same model. Uh, Hilton in, in Atlanta, same single group model. Uh, there's a, a hotel uh, in the Portland area, which is uh, the grand opening, I think, um, about two weeks. Same model as the single group model. Uh, the manufacturing business that I mentioned in the Fresno area, same single group model. Now, what has become more common, though, as we've seen a spike in EV-5 immigration, is the second model, which is the fund model. And this is really, this is really just pure project finance. And it seems, if we needed to characterize it in some way, it's, it's really a, almost like mezzanine debt. And so the investors are putting money into a single purpose entity, which I marked there as a fund, and the, and the fund is making a loan to the project entity. That EV-5 fund money is part of a capital stack that you would see in any large-scale uh, project finance deal. So um, <clears throat> the military base redevelopment that I mentioned uh, before follows the second fund model. The retail center down in Winter Park would follow this model as well. And there, uh, the Hollywood Park uh, redevelopment is, you know, there's a huge capital stack there that involves all kinds of different property uh, uh, principles. The solar, the utility scale solar follows this fund model right here. Okay, now that I turn off my phone, somebody gotta tell me what time it is. 12.03. Uh, Thank you very much. So we're gonna have all kinds of time for questions, so I hope you have a few. So, <clears throat> having run you through that, and hopefully you have some questions. You know, there are a lot of misconceptions about what immigration lawyers do in this field, or what actually what they should be doing in this field. And so one of the hazards of this, of course, is there's a lot of money swirling around. And so it's, it's, uh, it's not too gross of an, of an exaggeration for me to say that there are some professionally irresponsible practices by lawyers. And this is something we're very concerned about. And I, I'm not claiming to be a person of pure ethics and professional responsibility, but there are some things that seem obvious to me. So this field is highly interdisciplinary. If you can imagine, you know, Immigration lawyers, what are, what are they supposed to know something about? They're supposed to know something about the immigration law, right? And how do I file my application? And what documents do I need? And how fast can you file it? And after it's filed, can I travel? And how do I get back into the country? And if I get a green card, do I have to pay taxes? And you know, that's where we start saying, well, ask 
an accountant or a tax lawyer. That's, you know, I don't, you know, I know something about it, but I'm a little, I fear giving much advice about something I don't know a lot about. So, and that's where the interdisciplinary aspect starts. And if you can think about what I sketched out in the last, like the fund model, I mean, this involves corporate lawyers and securities lawyers and project finance lawyer specialists and real estate lawyers and zoning lawyers. And then it involves business plan writers and real estate specialists on both sides and financial uh, analysts and appraisers and loan underwriters. I mean, all kinds of professionals are involved in this process. And this is something we, uh, we really preach within our law firm that um, you know we're just we're just fiddly little immigration lawyers and we you know we, we we're really working hard just to understand that let alone all these other things so that's how i came up with this slide on common challenges for the lawyer and i mean the immigration lawyer so the first one is a client hires us or wants to hire us and says you know i have documents for this investment sure i made a five hundred thousand dollar investment it's all documented but as I hinted at earlier, that is not, you know, their perception, the client's perception about what they think they need for this process may be a lot different from what we, the lawyers, think they need. And I can, it's easy for me to say with 100% confidence, this is, the EB-5 application is the most transparent application that an intending immigrant could possibly file most transparent application. So no matter what this investor files initially with the U.S. Immigration Service, no matter what, the Immigration Service is within its right to ask for more or to probe different aspects of what was presented. So this first quote goes to that issue. There's, there's a reckoning that one needs to have with this prospective client or new client right away. And look, this is a transparent application. This could take a long time. You're going to hate us in preparing all these documents. And you need to be unemotional about this process, especially when the immigration service starts to cast doubt on the veracity of things that maybe you are characterizing in a certain way about your financial background. So it's a very difficult aspect of the process. And I can tell you that in our law firm, we have um, seven, eight lawyers plus another six or seven, eight staff people working on this almost all the time with our clients. So the next one is, person wants to hire you and says, I just want a green card. I'm willing to invest. Tell me, tell me what's going, what you're going to charge. And this, more often than not, you know, with, with the internet, we actually get this question before we're even hired. You know, it's it's the first, it's the first thing they send. I mean, they don't even want to know you. They just send you an email. And that's why we have different people to screen all these. But, but they just send an email. You imagine, that they, they. People, it's very common for people to think of EB-5 immigration as a commodity. You know, that it's so commoditized and that all these people are doing it. Why can't you just tell me what it costs for to get me and my family a green card through investment? Why can't you tell me that? It's the easiest thing. And they send that in an email. <laughs> no, it just, it's not so easy. Um, we, it's, it really matters a lot how far away this person is, what's their communication skills, you know, on that subject. We have, we speak uh, 18 non-English languages in our law firm. So we speak 19 languages. And, um, and probably, I don't know, what do you think, Elsie, maybe 60% of all of our clients are actually Chinese speaking. But even so, we have, whoops, and, and Cantonese, we have Cantonese and Mandarin, but we have, cover all these different languages. But it is really not easy to present a, a documented case in high, what can be technical business and financial terms when you're trying to describe somebody's background. 
And so if someone's far away and their English ability is not right up to snuff for all of our lawyers to, um, to really understand, and then we're going to be using translation and, and documents that have been tran uh, interpreted and, and there, there's this possible confusion about what is meant, and then add on top of that cultural gaps and maybe a lack of concern about a lawyer's professional responsibility and why don't you just file I give you, don't care what it said, you know, <laughs> there tends to be a professional uh, disconnect with sometimes. And, and if the person has no intermediary here in the U.S. to help them, you know, move this process along, all those things impact what our legal fee would be. Uh, not to mention what the person intends to invest in, which is a whole different discussion and can also complicate how difficult a matter is. But I find it humorous, really, this second quote, that people would send you an email and just say, how much does this cost? And uh, it's, it's really an impossible to answer. So then the third one is, why are you giving me so much of a headache uh, about what to invest in. I told you I want to be an investor and get a green card. I hired you to pick the investment for me. <laughs> oh my, this is, a big, this is a big problem for us because, well, for one, there's nobody in our law firm who has the right certification to be doing all of that due diligence, all that financial analysis as to what would be an appropriate investment. I mean, there are professionals who do that. And, but there is, a, there is a huge contingent of people out there who demand this kind of immigration and they want you to help pick the investment for them. Unfortunately, there are lawyers who are doing that for people too. And maybe sometimes they get it right. But as far as I can tell, often they get it wrong. And they should have referred, <laughs> they should have referred that to a financial professional who, you know, the real estate piece is, is challenging, understanding whether a business is going to be profitable or around in three or four years is important to know, and most immigration lawyers would have no idea how to evaluate that. So it's not unusual for a lot of different professionals to be involved in this process. And then this last one is, you know, I, you, know, you say your, your law firm is good and you have lawyers who are experienced with this, well, you're my lawyer, guarantee that my case will be approved. And this is, you know, this is just something we don't do. And I can tell you, I, our law firm are, uh, combined, you know, I've been doing this for about 20 years. I probably have more cases approved in the EP5 area than anybody. But I can tell you, just because of the number, it's very possible I have uh, more denials than anybody, too. I mean, it's possible. And I don't mind saying that, because the, this, area of immigration practice is very difficult. And one aspect that we haven't discussed is the USCIS, the government's always changing their standards. And they do that without advance notice. And maybe while you're midstream in this process, after this investment's already been made, 100 people have invested in this project, and it's just totally designed wrong, according to the USCIS. Well, that creates problems for the immigration appro approvability process. and so. Um, we can't guarantee that the case will be approved. We can evaluate what the investor intends to invest in and give some guidance as to whether that's crazy or whether it tends to make sense or whether, um, and, and identify what the immigration eligibility issues might be. So with that, I'm gonna open this up to some questions. And by the way, um, Maybe this is, this is, during this period, you can come up and get one of our brochures if you want. I have some business cards up there, and in the brochures, we feature all the different lawyers in the law firm. You can read about them. And, um, feel free to come up, but I don't think it'll be disruptive. I have a question. Um, a lot of EB-5 projects, or region says that um, they, when you invest the money in five years, they're not only giving you interest, but they'll give you the $500,000 back. And sometimes 
they, you know, what do they do? What does a client do, or whoever invested, do they, if they're guaranteed to get the money back, they don't get it back, do they sue them? This is a great question. What, and I don't know if everybody heard it, but she, uh, she uh, you try it. Yes, what it was is people are out there promoting the EV5 investment opportunity to prospective investors, and one of the sales, one part of the sales pitch is you will get your money back in five years. And, and, and so, uh, suggested in your question is somebody relying on that, and then if it doesn't happen in five years, then the second part of your question is can they just sue the person or the offer or business that's uh, got them into this investment? So the first part of that question that's important to realize is e the immigration law prohibits, absolutely prohibits the offer or to make a promise of that kind. That is, if that were known to the immigration service that the investor was promised to get back the principal and the investment in five years, the case would be denied. So that's the first thing. So <clears throat> the second thing about that question is I can only assume that the promise that she is asking about was an oral promise. Because if it were in writing, then as I said, it would be denied by the immigration office. Then the third part of the question is, well, could you sue the people? Well, you'd have to talk to uh, people, the lawyers, uh, people in the lawyers community who, who do that kind of work, and there might be a possible case to pursue. Of course, one thing will be an item of proof. And so I would say, if you have clients who are, are getting those kinds of promises made to them, and they're relying upon that for purposes of making the investment that is being promoted to them. They need to get that in writing from somebody. That would help in the proof later on. And I can assure you, they're not going to get it in writing. And if they do get it in writing, there's something fishy going on. Okay? So no guarantee. You can, one cannot. <laughs> Uh, the investor in the EB-5 case cannot receive a guarantee that principal or any part of principal is guaranteed to be paid back tomorrow or at any time in the future. And instead, it's, it's much more complex and gray. And what instead, if you were to think about the fund model that I had uh, set forth on one of the bottom of one of the slides, what happens is that investors as a group may you know, individually invest in that fund, and the fund in turn would make a loan to the developer. This fund entity that sits in between the developer or project company and the investors, it is a usually a special purpose entity that has, in other words, a narrow purpose, and that is to make a loan and to collect on the loans after five or six years. But that's not the same as the investor getting a promise. You, okay? Yes, in the back. How friendly is the investor with the Chinese research? I'm not only old, but I'm, I can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that if I'm new and we're going to ask you to China, how friendly is it? Can you get on for me? Uh, somebody want to repeat your question for me? You know, the outgoing, um, yeah. Yeah. Is he outgoing? And you and ambassador going to China? Is he a friendly, a visa friendly person, or what? Oh, you're asking a sort of a political question. No, no, I'm not, I'm not actually, because, because, you know, what, what I think is that when Gary Locke was, the, was uh, in charge of the, uh, Okay. You're you're saying that as a result of Gary Locke being the ambassador to China, this in some ways facilitated immigration from China. Exactly. And now that we have a change of the guard there. Uh, the U.S. representation in China, would that negatively impact immigration from China? 
I mean, you can find people, I mean, I don't know. That's the, that's the short answer, for me at least. But, I mean, all kinds of people have all kinds of opinions about that. And I don't, I don't see that happening in the inner workings of, of the immigration service. It could impact, though, legislation by, by members of Congress. Yeah. And you know, they're not doing anything there anyway, so. Eddie. Yeah, have, you, uh, have you heard uh, on the new, uh, new call uh, for uh, what you see be five, uh, it's gonna be uh, increased to uh, 30,000? Okay, so you are referring to uh, uh, what happens on the hill there in Washington, D.C.? Right, right. So this is just a political quagmire, and there are all kinds of different proposals that are submitted. But it's fairly clear that if the Congress wants EB-5 immigration to continue, then it needs to do something about the visa cap of 10,000 visas per year, and specifically with regard to the per-country cap for China. So there are all kinds of different bills that have been proposed. Now on the Senate side, we have a completed bill which is called Comprehensive Immigration Reform. It includes changes to the EB-5 program and all other kinds of immigration. On, this, on the other side of the hill, though, with the House of Representatives, they are taking a different tack, and that is to, by piecemeal legislation, to present different bills that address different aspects of immigration. At some point in time, they have to get together and, and reconcile what their different approaches are and see if they can enact some legislation. Um, the betting is presently that something like that has a, a chance to happen in the lame duck Congress uh, after the November election. So that is something, you're, what you specifically refer to is something that has been discussed and has, you know, has some legs, but there are all kinds of different obstacles that there in Washington to getting legislation enacted. And several questions. Um, is there any kind of an average cost or time needed in order to get the EB-5 put through? On is the there average? average time frame? Yeah. So the there's yes. Let's just say it's about a year to a year and a half on average presently for the application process to mature into a conditional green card. And cost? Cost. <laughs> well, <laughs> really depends who you hire. <laughs> so, the, of course, you have the investment cost. And they, let's say an investor was investing $500,000 minimum. It is not uncommon for the uh, promoters of this opportunity to charge administrative fees that are forty-five to fifty-five thousand dollars each, and then the investor also typically is responsible for uh, his or her own immigration lawyer fees, which could add you know, another fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars. So somewhere less than a hundred thousand dollars of costs. Fifty to one hundred thousand dollars of cost on top of the principal capital of five hundred thousand. And by the way, um, I know you, I think you have another question, but as an aside, you're talking about Congress. That's one of the first things in re, in revising EB five law. One of the first things they want to do is increase the minimum five hundred thousand to about seven hundred thousand. And the people who know something about this think that would not at all dampen the appetite for, for the visa. Okay, uh, second question, do all the documents, when they're finally put together, have to be in English? <laughs> Any documentation that is filed with the immigration office does have to be in English, yes. But for a law firm that's skilled in dealing with a lot of foreign language documents, we often are dealing with a lot of foreign language documents, but they, anything we need to use, we need to put it in English. And we're still filing paper, by the way. And you know, we got 
tons of paper that go with EB-5 applications. Hopefully the Immigration Service will accelerate what it's doing to do electronic filing. Hopefully this year they'll yeah, make more progress. Save a tree. Yes. Oh, yeah. Any any other questions? I know everybody's getting hungry for lunch. <laughs> yes. Um, I realize you're an immigration lawyer, but since you also have mentioned sometimes you have to be interdisciplinary, do you have any background in like capital finance, specifically say like bank secrecy and anti-money laundry? Okay, so. The, I didn't mean to suggest that I practice in an interdisciplinary way. We really try to confine our work to immigration aspects of the entire project. In fact, you know, we, we spend, a, because we're so involved on the EB-5 capital side, our, we've been involved in projects, they've raised more than $3 billion. But we, that doesn't mean we're uh, project finance lawyers. We have to read daily subscription agreements, offering memoranda, loan agreements, uh, a lot of other boring documents. <laughs> but we're really just looking at them for EB-5 ineligibility issues, okay? Kind of works, just as a uh, more specialized person, I guess. Well, <laughs> well, I have some background in business transactions, business litigation, yeah. but I don't really uh, hold myself out in that way that I'm some sort of business lawyer. Because I find that immigration law alone is difficult enough. And uh, you know, if I could just try to master one little thing in my life, that, that might be good enough. And besides, there are all kinds of other professionals who could do such a better job at all these other things. And it makes a lot of sense in protecting yourself to get them involved. Yes? According to the experience you did the uh, EB-5 and uh, from a conditional visa to permanent visa, so what's the percentage you did is the people approved? Very good question. Uh, you know, I had mentioned this conditional nature of EB-5 immigration is a real source of risk. And her question is, well, you get people approved. How, what percentage of them are not getting approved to get their condition removed? So, uh, I think there's a very, 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 very high percentage that are getting their conditions removed. Occasionally, we have to fight with the Immigration Service about different issues, such as maybe some aspect of the business over the course of the two or three years of conditional residence that that business has materially changed. Well. We get into a fight with the Immigration Service about whether they can approve the petition to remove the conditions. Four years ago, they were very rigid about that. Today, though, as of May 2013, they've changed their outlook on that, and they're much more liberal. And they will allow a material change in a business, and the investors can still get their condition removed. Uh, there are fights with the Immigration Service on this front as well as to job creation. If the job creation is not there, then we might get into a big fight with the Immigration Service about what is a reasonable period of time for the jobs to occur in the, in the future. And so this is a different area that we fight about. Um, there haven't been any, in our practice, major disasters with this. But I can tell you, back in the 1990s, it, it was really a mess. Uh, we had. And that, you know, there are all kinds of different explanations as to why. But there are still people here in the United States who still have conditional residence. They still are in a limbo. Going back to the end of the 1990s, and that's, you know, at least 15 years. So there are instances where that's a problem. Last question, please. Yeah, yeah, that's all I know. Uh, it's true. As well as past president and director of Chinese American Real Estate Professional Association of Southern California, uh, Mr. Chow has, Mr. Chow is also received of the consider, considerable award and honor from various organizations. 
included in this as who's who in uh, commercial real estate by Los Angeles Business Journal. Investor of the Year by California Real Estate Journal. Who's Who in Real Estate and Development Institute, Institute Industry. And Who's Who in Creative Real Estate, a man of the achievement. He was selected by Los Angeles Downtown News as top deal maker in Los Angeles. He is frequent lecturer, writer, and often uh, quote authority on real estate and industrial matter. So you, now you guys all know about him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's help me welcome Eddie Chow. Never been in business before? Uh, you probably can uh, look at it, our, our PowerPoint. <clears throat> it's very simple and it's not difficult to understand. If you have uh, any questions uh, that you want to uh, talk to me uh, separately, <clears throat> uh, you're more than welcome. You always can contact me. So let's uh, get started. <clears throat> uh, first of all, we uh, look at it. Uh, uh, some uh, notable transactions in Southern California. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, um, the transactions uh, is it's all uh, done uh, within uh, last year, uh, within last year or, or recently. Uh, uh, this is only uh, covers the Southern California. So uh, you know, there's a deals in uh, uh, in other places. Uh, uh, one deal, one uh, major deal, uh, uh, which. Uh, Lincoln Stone was uh, uh, was the lawyer uh, who helped uh, uh, one uh, uh, company put this uh, EV flight together. Uh, it's uh, SLA's uh, hotels in Las Vegas, and I think that finance uh, just the finance alone is four hundred fifty million dollars for renovation, and that's Chinese uh, uh, Chinese money too. So we're not covering the other state. We just talk about uh, Southern California for recent uh, recent transactions. So uh, uh, let's take a look at uh, who's buying what. Uh, the first one uh, is the Sheraton Hotel, Sheraton LAX. Uh, it closed on uh, last year, uh, November 20s. And uh, the buyer is from uh, Shenzhen. It's 802 rooms uh, and 50 million square foot of a meeting space. It's a major transaction. And the hotel uh, does need uh, renovation, so uh, I think the renovation uh, probably costs uh, somewhere around thirty to forty million dollars for renovation. Second one, it was uh, closed on uh, November twenty-first uh, last year. They're like one day apart uh, from the first one, <clears throat> and this is a seventy-five million dollars Torrance Marriott Hotel. Uh, buyer is uh, from uh, Sichuan, Chengdu. Total is 487 rooms, 35,000 square foot of meeting space. The third one is uh, uh, Sheraton Universal. It's $92 million. This is a little bit earlier. It was uh, uh, closing uh, February uh, 2012. And the buyer is uh, from Shenzhen, New World. It's 457 rooms and 28,000 square foot of meeting space. This one is uh, even uh, uh, older. 
This one is the same group. Uh, they bought this hotel first for $65 million, and this deal closed on March of 2011. And buyers the same group uh, sends a new work. And the facilities are 469 rooms plus uh, 28,000 square foot of meeting space. And this one uh, it is just closed uh, beginning of this year. I think this is uh, closed on, uh, on uh, uh, the, the Chinese uh, uh, Latin uh, festival, as, which is uh, uh, February 14. And the buyer, uh, you probably a lot of you uh, already know, it's Green Lane. And this project is uh, uh, entitled for 1.65 million square foot, which includes <coughs> hotels, condo hotels, apartments, and 400,000 square foot of uh, uh, office space. So total is 1.65 million square foot. And uh, uh, this one is, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, Greenland is from Shanghai. And it's actually a state-owned company. Shanghai uh, government-owned. And then the next one is a $180 million. It's even higher than uh, uh, price, the price tag. It's even higher than uh, uh, Greenland's. And this is uh, a public trade, a private company, but public trade uh, a real estate development company. It's called Ocean Y from Beijing. And this closed on last year, end of last year, December 24th. Buyer is Ocean Y Real Estate Group, Beijing. <coughs> And this project is an, an entitled for 45-story apartments or condos, 222 uh, rooms or uh, hotels, 200,000 uh, 200, square foot of uh, retail. Plus, uh, you probably see uh, the picture here, plus they have uh, uh, 60,000 square foot of uh, uh, the, the neons, which uh, generate about $6 million. Uh, Sixty million dollars a year for just from uh, that neon. And this one is a, a smaller project. It was just closed uh, recently. Uh, Seventeen point five million uh, uh, dollar. It's uh, about forty-eight uh, forty-eight acres and entitled for four hundred fifty-six uh, unit uh, senior housing. 83 units was built, and uh, uh, the facility uh, uh, have a clubhouse is about 14,000 square foot, and the uh, buyer is from uh, Beijing. So basically, uh, uh, this is uh, just uh, all the projects that uh, happened uh, within the uh, last year or two in Southern California. But overall, uh, the, if you are talking about other states, you're talking about uh, Northern California, San Diego, uh, Las Vegas, and plus uh, uh, New York, uh, uh, then uh, the transaction will be a lot of more. Uh, just uh, for Greenland, Greenland has uh, another project in New York, uh, the joint venture with uh, Foster City, and they actually own uh, the majority of the shares. Uh, Foster City sold the majority of the shares uh, to Greenland, <clears throat> and that project is much bigger than uh, the Los Angeles project. But Los Angeles project, uh, uh, in terms of um, the total project cost, it's over a billion dollar. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at uh, how can we uh, tap uh, this foreign investors uh, uh, market. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, uh, the Chinese, uh, uh, their, their capital from China is really coming over, uh, started from last year. I think this is related to uh, uh, the administration uh, change. Uh, the new uh, leadership, uh, uh, a lot of people don't feel comfortable, don't know what's going, uh, what's going on, don't know what will happen. So uh, many of them uh, just uh, figure, you know, we need to diversify. <laughs> I think that's the number one reason. Second would be the return. Uh, so well, let's, let's look at it there, there, how we can uh, uh, help uh, the investor, foreign investor invest in the United States. First one, uh, usually uh, that's what we do. 
Uh, usually, uh, we, we try to set up the appointment with the principal. You know, it's not the person uh, uh, like their representative, their friend, or their, uh, their whatever, okay? And usually, we ask uh, the principal to meet us. Uh, if uh, they cannot meet us here, no, we, we don't like to uh, meet them in China, but we have to meet them uh, face to face. And the main reason because, uh, number one, is that we need to uh, uh, understand what they're really looking for. Uh, they're they're uh, for investment purpose, they're for uh, green cards, they're for, uh, for, for their kids, uh, you know, or they're for some other reason, uh, which we don't know. If it's for investment, then uh, usually uh, we need to find out uh, what they're really looking for. They're just uh, trying to diversify their portfolio, they're try looking for a cash flow, they're looking for an upside, or they're looking for a private ownership. You know, because look at all the projects, we just look at it. It's private ownership. And uh, in terms of the yield, we don't know. We don't know if the yield is uh, it's, it's an excellent deal or not, but every single deal is private ownership, as you can see. <coughs> so let's uh, talk about the investment alternative. <laughs> Investment alternative, by, uh, uh, we, uh, when we are counseling uh, our, our potential clients, we uh, usually would tell them, say, so, you know, uh, we, we try to understand their financial, uh, their financial uh, uh, backgrounds, and, uh, and then we'll give them the suggestions. Uh, for example, like, you know, people say, oh, here's all, all the money I have. I have uh, 10, 20 million dollars, and I plan to, uh, you know, yeah, immigrant to the United States and here's all my money, I only can do it one time. In that case, I usually, uh, what we will do is uh, we'll tell them, says, oh, you gotta have uh, some uh, money allocated for security for like Morgan Stanley guys, for you know any person, uh, Merrill Lynch guys, and to uh, talk to them and have uh, some security allocation. And then, uh, uh, you know, for a CD, you, know, you always need to have maintain some cash available. and. The rest of it, then we look at real estate okay? because uh, real estate uh, is not very liquid. So once we're in, uh, you're you're in long term, you know, and you cannot just uh, you know cash out on the second date. So so that's well what we uh, uh, usually do uh, on the first counseling, uh, try to find out their uh, their real financial situation and uh, help them not to uh, not that allocated the uh, right proportion now for for their investment. And the uh, second one will be uh, tax consideration. Because any investment, uh, if you don't uh, put in tax consideration uh, into it, and you get your yield uh, before tax, uh, that will really uh, doesn't make any sense, especially uh, for foreigners. And for, the, for most of our clients, they are foreigners, and, uh, they're, and, and, and they're sizable foreigners. When I say they're sizable, it's like, uh, you know, when you talk to them, uh, the, at the very beginning, they probably say, oh, we want to go to the United States, well, we want to be a United States uh, uh, you know, green card uh, residence, or we want to, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, finally uh, get the U.S. citizenship. <coughs> and, but after you explain to them, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, all the pros and cons of uh, being a United, uh, United States uh, citizen or taxpayer, uh, I always say 95% of uh, my clients reject U.S. citizenship and taxpayers' status. So, uh, so uh, uh, that will make our, our job is more complicated because if our job, if, if they say, yeah, we decided to uh, become a U.S. citizen and taxpayer, and that's pretty easy. That we just, uh, you know, like uh, any Americans. <clears throat> but once when they decided that they don't want to be uh, become uh, U.S. taxpayers and they just want to invest in the United States, then uh, the whole structures, uh, the capital structures, the energy structures will be uh, very complicated. I think the next section is, is uh, uh, the uh, tax section uh, for, for international investors, which I think you, know, you guys can uh, uh, learn much more than, uh, uh, than, uh, um, than from me. And besides, uh, uh, the profit uh, expa uh, expa uh, patriation, uh, same thing. Uh, if uh, if you are decided to be a U.S. taxpayer or you decided that you want to maintain your foreign status, uh, this is very important uh, on a company of uh, the capital structure on your uh, uh, capital structures. <coughs> then risk consideration. 
So once when we are after the, the tax consideration, uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, we'll talk to uh, talk about uh, uh, risk. What kind of risk they they can uh, uh, they can afford? Uh, they can uh, uh, afford a project five years without any cash flow, or they have to have the cash flow. They have to have the cash flow, and. Uh, uh, I have uh, many, many clients that come over here and say, oh, here's all the money I have, uh, $20 million, uh, my wife, myself, my kids are all going to be settled down in the United States. We don't have a job, we don't have anything. We need the incomes, okay? So you have to understand what they really need. So you know, for guys like that, you know, if you give them a, a piece of job, Rawlin in uh, Riverside County, it takes five years to get entitlement and later sell it, then, uh, you know, they, they probably be work. Yeah, they can realize the profit. They already, they already bankrupt. So you really have to understand what they're looking for. They're looking for core assets. So core asset that means uh, that it's a stabilized, A class, uh, uh, either office building, apartments, uh, retail centers, uh, retail centers such as uh, uh, anchor with a grocery and drug store, and with the inland store. Those are the basic core assets. Okay. In, in good location, good neighborhood, those assets uh, provide you a good cash flow, but you have a limited upside. It, this is uh, very normal. Okay. You have a good cash flow, you have a limited upside. Second type of uh, assets, and they say, oh, you're more, more capable. I'm, 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 I used to be a uh, developers in China, so, so I'd love to uh, get something, uh, get hands-on, uh, get something uh, uh, accomplished myself. So we'll find some projects uh, with uh, existing cash flow, but it does provide a value-add uh, opportunity. Uh, a couple of hotels that uh, we just look at, it, those are typical, typical, you know, they're buying at 5%, 5.8% of a cash flow, <coughs> existing cash flow, but after renovation, uh, $20 million renovation, $40 million renovation, their yield, will, uh, their, uh, their total investment in the yield will be like a rich uh, 7%, 7.5, 7.8% that uh, on the cash flow. But um, in terms of uh, value, that will be an increase uh, tremendously. Okay? So those are the value add uh, assets. And uh, so, you know, some of the uh, clients are interested, some of the clients are not interested. So, you know, it really depends on what, what type of they are, what type of uh, uh, person they are. And third one will be a highly appreciated assets. Highly appreciated assets, uh, you know, you speculate. You, you expect that the property will appreciate a lot, you know, about three times, five times more, uh, five years later, 10 years later. Is there any asset like this? Yes all over the United States, okay? Of course, not in Southern California, but there, there are a lot of places that has an asset like that. Las Vegas is a typical, typical uh, place that uh, you can find those type of assets. You know, you, uh, you, you pay one-tenth of the value they used to pay. And uh, do you need to do anything? Nothing. You, know, you just sit tight and uh, wait that someone, uh, some uh, big casino will, will buy from you, you know? And this will happen, of course. When the markets, uh, when the economies come back, you know, the, uh, when people spend the money on uh, more money on gambling, you'll see, you'll see that the, the, the value will come back. So, but for the the asset, this type of asset, uh, for a person they need a cash flow, can they buy? Of course not. Yeah. So you have to really understand your client, what what type of client that they are. Now, if you need a cash flow, your value add. They're looking for highly appreciated asset. Procedure. Let's talk about you know after the counseling. So uh, they say, okay, we're going to hire you. We're going to uh, work with you. And uh, I don't know about how you work on it, but in our company, uh, we do need a, a client to sign an engagement letter with us. I mean, if they don't sign an engagement letter with us, the counseling stop and you know, our services stop, and where there's, there's no more conversation going on. Uh, uh, but if they agree to engage uh, engage us, then we'll start processing, we'll find the deals for them. Uh, and usually the procedure is that they have to engage a professional team. They agree to engage a professional team. This including, uh, of course, uh, uh, your investment advisor, 
is including uh, you need a, a, a legal counsel, is including uh, you need a tax com counsel, tax com uh, consultant. And uh, once when you have uh, the tax cons uh, tax, con uh, tax consultant, you need a, uh, you have uh, the legal consultant, and you have uh, the uh, investment advisor, then we can get started. Uh, investment, uh, the, uh, their, their, uh, identify their investment target. You know, find out their, it's value add, it's uh, a highly appreciated asset. And then uh, forming the proper uh, structures, uh, uh, forming the proper uh, proper entities. Uh, again, like I say, okay, because all these guys are, are foreigners, and they uh, uh, usually they maintain their foreigner status, so it's kind of complicated. Uh, you gotta have uh, uh, a tax consultant to help you, or a tax attorney to help you to form the right entities. From overseas to the United States, and to the once when this uh, to the United States depends on their like a multiple investor, a multiple project investor, or and each year they want to invest a project, two project, or they're like a single asset one time, and that's it. So their, their structure will be all different. In the capital structure, uh, because uh, you did decided to maintain their foreigner status, uh, there's a lot of ways that uh, you can take advantage uh, of uh, being a foreign uh, entities. Uh, one of the big, uh, one of the uh, uh, advantage of being a foreigner is, uh, you know, for, for deals like portfolio loans, if you know how to use that, uh, take advantage of the portfolio loans, that will reduce your tax uh, to a very, very low, uh, even lower than the Americans. Then uh, uh, we uh, uh, will prepare the letter in ten. And uh, if the letter of intent accept, uh, uh, then we start to uh, finalize the letter of intent, uh, not, not uh, finalize the purchase and sale, uh, and sign the purchase and sale, put in the deposit, and then, uh, 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 and besides, I uh, will try to uh, get uh, conventional finance uh, for, for, uh, for the project. Because very few people want to use 100% of the equity. If you have uh, $100 million a deal, uh, you know, you put a 40%, $40 million uh, equity, uh, 60, $60 million uh, uh, usually will help them to get uh, conventional finance. Yeah. Now it goes to that, uh, 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 once we have a contract, you start doing uh, your due diligence. Uh, for buyer sign, and there's a lot of things you have to do. You have to, uh, you have uh, the legal due diligence, this including uh, you read the preliminary report, uh, read the other contract. If it's a hotel, you read the franchise agreement, you read the management agreement, you read all the vendors agreements, uh, service contract agreements. This is all legal uh, stuff. Uh, survey, uh, you need a survey, uh, survey uh, surveyor uh, to get AOTA because uh, if you get the finance, uh, uh, then they will ask you to have an AOTA policy. Title, of course, now this is a part of uh, uh, due diligence work, and you have to read the title report. Uh, all the exceptions, all the things that that you, know, you do not like, uh, you have to uh, print it up uh, from your lawyers. Print it up, but uh, within five days, within uh, ten days after you accept, uh, uh, after you receive uh, this uh, 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 title report, and disapprove all the items uh, that you know you you, you don't like to uh, uh, stay on on the title report. And then your lawyer will start talking to a you know, seller's lawyer and talk to them and eliminate uh, which one, which one, which one. And some then uh, if they say, well, we cannot eliminate, then uh, it depends on uh, we, you can accept all that. Financial due diligence, of course, uh, I don't have to say. Everybody knows you have to do the financial due diligence. You have to look at the past performance. You have to look at the, the new performer. <coughs> And usually a performer who's doing that, we're, we're the one who's doing the new performance. And tax, uh, tax credit review, uh, tax credit review are for many projects, not that project located, the, the particular location you have a tax credit. So you need a, a tax credit consultant uh, to help you to look at it now if you have a tax credit. And now, I don't know, you, you know tax credit, uh, sometimes uh, you will get uh, the, uh, 
the free money from the government because you're just locating the right location. And uh, or you get the subsidized, uh, uh, either subsidized from them, get free money from them, or you kind of get like a uh, uh, government guarantee a uh, 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 low interest rate loan. Okay, so many, many kind of uh, 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 financial benefits. So you, you hired some uh, uh, tax, uh, uh, tax consultant to help you to review this tax credit. Besides, uh, when you are uh, work on the transactions, you also uh, need to a uh, uh, tax consultant help you to review the depreciation, the life of the depreciation. If you have uh, a very, uh, um, uh, if you have a project generate a lot of cash flow, uh, you need someone to uh, help you to look at the depreciation, uh, uh, the life of the depreciation. Because uh, any projects, uh, if, they, if you want to divide it into a different life of the depreciation. Uh, you can uh, uh, fully utilize uh, the, uh, uh, the life uh, of the depreciation uh, that will offset your, uh, your income. And of course, a uh, third party uh, a report, like a phase one report, like a physical inspection report, all kinds of report. This buyers that due diligence. In fact, there's a lot of third party report. It's gonna be ordered by your lender. It's not gonna be ordered by you, okay? So let's look at the lender's due diligence. Of course, they need a order a crystal report. Uh, they need an Elta survey. They will talk to the title company, and uh, they will have uh, the fiscal inspection. And usually, uh, from the fiscal inspection, if the project has a little uh, structure issue, then they will order the structure inspection. And uh, uh, besides, that, there's a, uh, if they bring up uh, like uh, you have the mold issues, a lot of hotel has the mold issues because of the an uh, old, uh, uh, old uh, 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 desktop uh, all, always have a uh, leaking issues. So you know, once when they have a uh, leaking issues, uh, you know, when you have uh, uh, buying the hotels, uh, make sure there's no mold. Once when you have a mold, you, it's kind of like your hotel got the cancer. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to fix it, you know, and it, it's very costly. And so that's why the hotel management is very important. You know, usually at a good hotel management company, they will never let it happen. They always uh, sell the, the tiles and all this stuff, so you'll never have that problem. If the bad management management company, and then uh, you will, you'll find out this when you when you look at it, open up open up your your dry, uh, open, up, uh, open up your tiles, you will find out this uh, all your drywall is all got molded. You know? And once when that happens, you, you're you know, it's, it's going to cost you a fortune. Phase one report. Uh, from phase one report, that they usually do identify this is a contaminant site, and they also will tell you this is, you have uh, other uh, issues uh, such as uh, you have asbestos, you have uh, the uh, leak pan, uh, you have uh, all these uh, potential issues. Uh, uh, usually, uh, in the uh, phase one report, uh, uh, that, that, that it's all covered. Okay, so let's look at it. Uh, uh, Working with all these foreign investors, now they have uh, you know, special uh, uh, characteristic. Uh, their, their witness is they don't know the market, they don't know uh, the procedures, they don't know, uh, uh, they, they make decisions very slow. And the reason they make decisions very slow because, uh, you know, again, uh, as I say, they don't know the market, they don't know the procedures. And uh, another thing which is kind of important, they are not no knowing by they are not known by uh, seller. So in other words, uh, you know they say, oh, we're, we're big companies, or this, or that. We check our website, and we uh, make a letter of intent, or pre present a letter of intent. <coughs> uh, who cares? If you're big, uh, big companies in China. Uh, show me you have money or not. Okay. <laughs> so you, know, you don't have the money. Now you tell me how big you are. But who cares? No one cares because everybody follow the procedures here. Everybody and uh, usually uh, all these uh, companies they all tell you is that when you present your when you present your offer, <coughs> show me where's your money, okay? Uh, so you know you say, oh, we don't need to show. Now tell them uh, look at our website. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay, look at the website. It doesn't work. And sometimes they say, oh, give me a uh, give me like a three months old uh, bank statement. It, it doesn't work. Okay, those are useless. 
And you think that people will look at you and say, oh, three months ago, you have a three, $900 million R&D on, on the balance sheets. Who cares? Three months already. Who knows uh, that the second day you will show the money or not, right? <laughs> so no, no, no one will take that. Yeah. Today, that you want to, you want it, uh, your your letter intent being accepted and pay a, people will pay attention to your letter intent. You need a bank reference letter. You need a bank write up a letter that says this is a good client of us. This is guy has uh, a nine digit, uh, low nine digit numbers, mid nine digit, uh, nine digit numbers in our bank, liquid assets in our bank. Okay, that what works. If you say it's uh, the three months old, that bank statement is useless. And, uh, uh, and a lot of times they say, oh, look, I tell them, look at our website. Your website is Chinese. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so who can read the Chinese? <laughs> okay. Uh, so you, 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 and you don't have to be uh, like a feel embarrassing to tell them, says, oh, you know what, this doesn't work. Well, just tell them in front of them. You know, you have to tell them, yeah, yeah, nicely, but you have to tell them firm. Okay, you tell them so this will not work, and don't try it because even you try it, it's not working. Yeah. And uh, their strength is cash rich. They have a lot of cash, which is uh, very true. Uh, they're, you know, we can tell them be fle uh, flexible on the due diligence, on the due diligence period in closing time. Okay. And the reason uh, because I say this is their strength, because uh, when you work with uh, big firms like, uh, you know, if it's a Prudential, if it's a uh, MetLife, if it's G Capital, they have a certain procedure they have to follow. Certain day or to do the due diligence, certain days are to do this, certain day to uh, close the deals. So, so all the person, who, all the employee who work on the deals, they're employee. So they're, they're basically follow the procedures, okay? But for, for individual guys, our uh, company, uh, head of company uh, from uh, China, they can make that decision. How can you uh, present yourself differently than uh, the other competitors? Because uh, when you buy these big assets, who's the, who's the other buyers? Everybody's the institution in, in locally. And you think that they cannot compete with you? You're wrong. Okay, they have more money than you. They're, they have a transaction record that's uh, much, much better than you. Potential life, okay, potential realty, um, uh, 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 G capital. Do they uh, have less uh, asset than you have? <coughs> Impossible, right? So the only way you can uh, uh, make yourself uh, different than, uh, than them and better than them is you have a shorter ASCO. You have a shorter uh, due diligence period. You give them a very large amount of a deposit at the very beginning. And uh, when, you know, one time we got the deals, we got a few deals like this. When we uh, buy uh, uh, 1997, when we buy uh, uh, this uh, uh, area, downtown area, uh, in fact, two times. First time we buy the downtown area hotels, uh, we're putting a $5 million non-refundable deposit when we present the letter in 10. Because seller is my life. So we have no concern that they're cheating us, that they, they have anything they cannot disclose to us. Huh? So, so we could give them a $5 million number front with deposit. That's how we get the deal, because no one else do that. Second time, the hotel becomes uh, over $100 million. We give them a $10 million uh, non-refundable deposit. Okay? At the time when we presented the letting tank, 28 offers, 27 are institutions. We're the only person, we're the only entities that we, uh, we're nobody. But we got the deal. So that's how you get the deals, okay? And otherwise, uh, you, you cannot compete. But you think that uh, we're do, doing this something uh, Ridiculous? Let me tell you how uh, Steve Wayne buy back the design. He, uh, uh, after he lost the, the uh, Bellagio, now he, Bellagio basically is his hotel. He built the hotel, but he was forced out by Wall Street because he's a big spender. Now he loved to spend the money. <laughs> so they forced him out, you know, wow. forced him out. So after he, he was forced out, he sold all his stock and he got cash on him. And at the time when the star would just bought this up uh, 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 
Sheraton. Sheraton including one brand called Luxury Collection, which uh, Disney is part of our Luxury Collection. So when, uh, when uh, uh, Star Wars bought this, uh, at that time, they have no idea gaming was so profitable. So they said, oh, we don't do gaming. Okay. So the, the Disney immediately uh, uh, Steve went and found out there's an opportunity. So he, go to, uh, he went to uh, 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 Kinetic to see this guy, <coughs> to see Barry. And he told Barry, $30 million non-refundable deposit, cashier's check. He said, it's yours today. I buy your hotels. No due diligence. Wow. Yeah. $30 million. That's how you get the deal. Mm -hmm. That's how you get the deals. Show the cash. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately. There, he flagged there, he presented a check. He said, it's a $30 million cashier's check made to your company. If you sell to me, it's your check. You can cash tomorrow. <laughs> That's how you get the deals. Okay. Anyway, uh, so. <coughs> Let's look at it, this. Uh, how can uh, an overseeing investor overcome their weakness? Get a good consultant. Get a good advisor, lawyers, brokers, who uh, uh, get himself educated on the market, on the procedures, uh, hire the experienced uh, and well-known consultant, and that's usually uh, how you get the deals. A lot of times uh, when we represent our clients, to uh, make an offer, he said, why I pay you so much money? I said, because my name. He said, I use my name. I said, your name, they will not pick up you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, he said, oh, we're a big company. I said, you're a big company, no one knows you. Okay, but everybody knows me. Okay, so I said, use my name, that's how you, why you need to pay me. Okay. <laughs> get ready. For uh, all these investors, uh, they have to get ready. Okay, their entity form, uh, proper entity form. A lot of times, uh, if they, they decided to uh, stay as a foreigner, they have to form uh, different entities, a few layers of different entities. So they have to form uh, off, uh, oversee uh, offshore uh, entities. They have to form the uh, United States entities. And usually, if they have a multiple investment, they have to form uh, more than one uh, entities uh, in, the, in the United States, more than one layer of uh, the entities in the United States. And uh, formulate uh, the exit strategies. They have to know how they uh, um, get the money out of the country later on. And and the, this one is important. This one, uh, someone just asked me, how uh, can uh, they uh, uh, get the money out of China? <coughs> Chinese uh, governments, uh, uh, in order to balance the trade uh, deficit. Chinese government uh, a few years ago started and says, okay, you know, if you guys are planning to uh, invest in the, in, investing uh, in the United States, go right ahead, okay. File the application, uh, you know, if you're a hundred million dollars or less, you know, your, your, your domestic uh, profit uh, can handle that for you. If it's uh, over a hundred million dollars, then you have to file in, uh, in uh, uh, cap, uh, central capital. And uh, uh, you get a, you'll get approval. Uh, usually, the time that uh, takes about three months to five months. Take take, take a quite a long time. And so uh, you know, there's no deal waiting for you for three to five months. Uh, either you you're in or you're not in. Okay. So once when they submit the uh, letter, they tell you to submit the letter intent to close the deal. Usually, it's about sixty days. Uh, the longest is probably ninety days. So you say, oh, I, I need to uh, three months to get uh, uh, to get uh, 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 government approval, and if, if if that's your condition, they will not pick up you. Guaranteed, they will not pick up you. So in order to uh, to uh, uh, to get yourself uh, be competitive, you have to uh, work with a lender to get a letter of credit, to get a letter of credit from uh, lenders, and uh, the lender can uh, provide you. Uh, a letter says uh, we're gonna set, uh, we're, uh, this guy has uh, uh, fifty million dollars or seventy million dollars of line credit with us. Plus the balance, uh, we'll finance the, the balance. Okay, so you get on the bank reference letter like this, then you got the deal. Otherwise, they say, oh, I need three months to get approval. They're not gonna take you. So, well, how you can get uh, uh, letter credit? 
uh, without any uh, uh, any assets in the United States. Our China government uh, give uh, certain banks, uh, not all the banks, give the certain banks them uh, each year give them the quota, so uh, uh, they can have uh, uh, they 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 can uh, write up this uh, letter credit from uh, uh, their domestic bank in China, write up a letter credit issued to uh, their, their U.S. branch. And so the U.S. branch can, based on that letter credit, issue uh, you a letter credit here. And usually uh, the letter credit costs you, uh, depends on what site. But you know, if it's in China, it costs you about 0.25%. Uh, in here, it costs you a little more. Uh, so you, know, you use a letter credit to do the whole entire transaction, or you can use a letter to do uh, as your equity and then the balance finance. So get a credit uh, credit lines with uh, the proper lender is very important. You don't you don't have this done, you your very intent is, is trash. It's useless. No one will look at it. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, you know for for uh, the offshore lenders, uh, foreigners, uh, foreign investors, you know, uh, when we present the learning intent, usually uh, we, we show them uh, our strengths. We uh, put up a large, very large amount of deposit, and we have a very strong bank reference letter, and that's how we uh, usually that's how we get the deal. Um, due diligence and closing time, same thing. Okay, shorter due diligence, uh, no finance contingency, and shorter closing times. And that's how you can get the deal. Otherwise, uh, you always remember, you're competing with the United States uh, institution. Okay, your buyers, uh, they're all uh, United States uh, institution, so it's hard to compete with them. You know, if you don't, don't do the things differently. And uh, we look at the deals, uh, so it depends on the, the buyer. If the buyer, everything's ready, then that's fine. Yeah, we, uh, we, can, we can participate at the bidding wall. Uh, if they are not ready, uh, but they really like the assets, then the better I'll uh, find the assets, which is not the least, or uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, we uh, uh, we can exclusively uh, represent them and uh, negotiate with the, the seller. Otherwise, uh, if it's a bidding, uh, you know, a bidding process, and, uh, you, you don't have a chance. And lastly, uh, uh, when 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 uh, we always tell them, so we're in the United States, you do whatever we do here. You don't do uh, the way you do there. I have a, uh, I have a, a guy uh, says, oh, he wanted to uh, add value to uh, assets. He said, oh, he wanted to add uh, additional rooms. He wanted to put this and want to put there. I said, I said well, you, you, you have to go to apply. And then uh, he said, uh, uh, can you talk to the mayor? I said, no, we don't talk to the mayor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you talk to the mayor, you talk to the councilman, it's useless. Okay, because you don't have a permit, you don't have a permit. Yeah. Okay. Later, you have a problem to sell, huh? Right. right. Okay. So I said, well, will you come to here the way we do? Okay. You don't. He said, oh, you don't understand that you need to talk to them. Okay. I said, no, we don't talk to them. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, so uh, those are the type of things that we uh, uh, usually we go through with our our our, our uh, potential investors, and uh, um, at the end. They sign an engagement letter, or they don't. If they don't sign an engagement letter, then we stop. Okay. If they sign an engagement letter, then we start. So that's what we do. Uh, oh, I have uh, some uh, chart that I can uh, show you. Here's the chart. I know you can see it, yeah. but you know, if you look back, it's probably easy to clear. Yeah. Here's a chart, and you know, if you want, I think that the board will forward you uh, my uh, PowerPoint, right? Okay. Okay. So you know, any any PowerPoint, any uh, presentation on today with uh, with the PowerPoints, you you can ask the board to send it to you. Okay. So you don't have to write anything. Here's a chart. You now the this is not the entire the, the flow. Exactly. Um, well. And uh, here's the due diligence items and schedules that usually we, uh, we, we uh, go through, with that, as you can see. It's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Yeah. And uh, 
uh, the simple usually uh, they always ask you how much it cost me besides the transaction uh, uh, dollar amount and uh, uh, why I think this is kind of important you don't want to surprise them yeah, especially the hotel deals because hotel deals uh, usually uh, you have a uh, uh, pretty large amount of uh, uh, furniture fixture and equipment uh, reserve account uh, and, and, and buyer usually have to uh, use cash for cash use a dollar for dollar to buy that account and that account sometimes up to uh, four or five million dollars uh, and besides the entire transaction will cost you somewhere around a million dollars or more okay so so you you have to let them know uh you know don't like you know say oh here's a 75 million dollars and they're prepared automatically just enough for 75 million dollars oh. so oh, where's my fee oh he said oh, never you never told me <laughs> <laughs> you never give me the estimate okay so you have to uh, give them the estimate of the, uh, before closing. Don't surprise them. Say, oh, here's the, this amount, this amount, this amount. And you have to, uh, on top of uh, the uh, acquisition price, you have to prepare three, four, or five million dollars for taking over uh, for uh, for closing the deals. So basically, uh, this uh, uh, simple closing uh, statement will show them. And we uh, usually, uh, what we do is uh, we put it into a Chinese so they can read. You know. <laughs> And that's it. So uh, uh, we have a time for a question. Yeah, for a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. My question is. Thank you. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. My question is for a foreign offshore company. Um, what's the best entity for? For them in the U.S. Uh, say that again. I didn't know. For uh, foreign uh, offshore company. Yeah. What's the best entity? What's the best form? entity? Depends on what that person uh, want. The person, uh, uh, if the person, let, uh, as I say, okay, if the person that just have a one lump sum money and one time deals, uh, it will be different than uh, you know, he has a multiple investment, and uh, and he you know he plan to uh, invest it year after year. So it, it, it's all different, and you have to talk to your tax consultant. Yeah. yeah uh, excuse me, uh, I'm a tax consultant. Oh. <laughs> 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 and I, um, um, is it going to be? Um, it's going to be multiple. Multiple investment. Yes. Multiple investment. Uh, and if it's a multiple investment uh, in a different state, right? Right. Okay. Well, in that case, um, yeah, it's usually it's, uh, it's much better that you have an offshore company. I, uh, is your client uh, very wealthy? Yes. Okay. If if they're very wealthy, of course they they will stay as a foreigner. They will yes. not, not want to be a big. They, no. I don't think no. they want to be a U.S. Yeah, no. taxpayer. No. So in that case, uh, you have to have uh, one offshore company. Uh, and usually, uh, you, know, you, you can just go to Hong Kong and set up that company. Uh, there's a pros and cons of uh, set up the company in Hong Kong. Uh, the, the, the pros is that they're just like a BBI, but they don't get much attention. Okay? The cons is that they're part of China. So you, you never know what they, one day a China, China government says, oh, show me all this stuff. Okay, anytime they can do that. So, yeah, so you always have that problem. But if you use a uh, Cayman Island, you use a BBI, and you have the issues uh, that the United States uh, want to look at it very carefully. <laughs> because everybody uses a BBI in Cayman Island right now. And uh, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of money. Uh, they, they they figure that they're either laundry money, they're terrorist money. So they watch that uh, BBI and, and uh, Kim Island very carefully now. Okay. So you don't you get their attention. Okay. So once when you have uh, the BBI, you have the offshore company set up. You come to the United States. You go to uh, uh, Delaware. You set up uh, the their holding company, U.S. holding company, and uh, the single shareholder is your offshore company. And, and use that uh, 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 companies to to have uh, the multiple investment. Each one will be uh, the U.S. domestic LLC. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is it going to be a series LLC like one master and then? No, no, no. Your 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 holding company into the United States uh, so, supposed to be uh, a C corporation because uh, they're foreigners. 
the foreigners. So the only uh, legal entity they can form is a C corporation. Yeah. Or, or LLC. LLC, they cannot. No. They cannot. They're, they're not uh, US, uh, US uh, uh, entities. So they cannot. They have to be a foreigner as a C corp. The next section is uh, the person from Pricewaterhouse. I think that he's going to talk about the tax for foreigners. I think it's much, much, uh, he will talk in much more detail than, than me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Would you like to wave to everybody? <laughs> Mr. Gary Chan is a principal with the CPA firm of Timo at Johnny LLP in Pasadena. His practice includes estate and trust, corporation, partnership, and high net worth individuals. Before joining his current firm, he was a tax director with PwC in their LA office where he focused on ultra high net worth individuals as well as estates and trust. He served as an adjunct professor of tax at Cal State of LA from 96 to 2008. He taught corporate and partnership taxation to both graduates and undergrads. Mr. Chan currently is both an attorney and a CPA. He received his BS degree in business administration with both emphasis on accounting from Cal State LA, where he graduated with honors. He received his Juris Doctorate from Loyola Law School in LA. He is a CPA since 1982 and an attorney since 1993. Living, um in the desert somewhere. But other than that, um, I'm going to focus on um, the estates and gift issues that are involved with holding a real estate. To be honest with you, uh, for a foreigner, real estate is the worst investment for a foreigner to own because it's subject to tax no matter what you do with it. What's the best assets to own? For a foreigner, for a foreigner, it's anything that's not connected with the U.S. <laughs> what I mean by that, physically existing. Because for a foreigner, the ideal asset is something you don't even see. Can't even touch it. Can't even smell it. It's called intangible assets. And what is real estate? Tangible. Tangible. And, you know, for a foreigner, they're subject to tax if there's anything tangible in the U.S. So I tell all my foreign clients, whatever you do, don't own anything in the U.S. Because if you, the moment you die, you're going to have to pay the, the wealth tax on whatever you own in the U.S. That could include real estate, and it could include um, currency, bank accounts, certain types of bank accounts. There's, there's, because the rules are so complicated, I'm just saying in general sense, but when you get specific, some are exempt, some are not exempt. And I don't want to bore you with what is exempt, not exempt, because you won't remember the moment you walk out this door. <laughs> but let me just give you some basic, basic information that's, that's very critical. And sort of compare between you, what a U.S. person face and what a non-U.S. person, basically a foreigner. Many of you are aware that we're all subject to the estate tax. And what is the estate tax? It's the tax on your wealth, accumulated wealth, at the time you die. Now we're also, because we're US persons, we're given a lifetime exemption amount. How much is our lifetime exemption amount that they allow us? Five million index for inflation. Right now, for this year, it's about five million, 300,000 roughly, or 340 for those who are very precise. I heard there was a mathematician in here. <laughs> but anyways, um, so that's the amount of assets um, that, that is exempt from the estate tax. The estate tax is currently about 45%, which isn't too bad. It used to be 55%. So it's still not too bad. But the thing about it is that as a U.S. person, we can make annual gifts of $14,000 a year to anybody we so choose. Did anybody hear about that? Somebody's giving away like hundreds of dollars, you know, if you can yeah. do it tw all yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. All he's doing is making gifts, you know, be it that it's only a hundred dollars. Question? Yeah, that's 
14,000 counts towards your 5 million, right? I'm sorry? That 14,000 counts towards your 5 million. Uh, no, it does not. It does not. It's in addition. In addition to that. It's every That's year. Every year you can give away 14,000. And that is on top of your 5 million lifetime. You don't even have to touch the 5 million. Until you die. Until you die. Yeah, it, it, everything's in digital inflation. Do you have fourteen thousand right now? <laughs> you can you can give to your you know to a child, what, whomever, a friend, uh, a special friend, a closer friend, whatever person. You can give fourteen thousand dollars away without any gift tax. And I can give it to unlimited number of people. Unlimited number of people. My pockets are open. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's pockets open. <laughs> He's gonna pass a hat around. <laughs> He's gonna pass a hat around. Um, but if you are a foreigner, the rules are tricky because you have to look to see what type of assets being given it determines whether or not that uh, it's a gift or, uh, or if it's a taxable gift. And for a foreign person is a basically a non-citizen, non-resident. They um, they have restrictions and they have limitations that are bizarre, to say the least. Um, I'll give you a good example. If if they give if they made a gift, typical typical types of gift that I have seen over these many years is that typically foreign parents would give their kids a house say in Arcadia, or in, you know, um, where is it, in Irvine, or something like that, where they can go to school, um, UCI, or USC, or UCLA, something like that. The problem is, that's a taxable gift. It's a taxable gift. Foreigners don't get the $14,000. So typically, what we advise foreign clients to do is to make foreign gifts, gifts made overseas. Well, it's kind of hard to get a piece of real estate overseas and drag it here into the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the typical types of gifts that we see or recommend is mostly cash, for, you know, cash gifts made overseas, because that's usually won't be subject to U.S. Uh, gift taxes, and it's done overseas. So typically what they do is they open a bank account in the child's name and the child would have the money come into the U.S. just to avoid uh, gift taxes for their parents. But uh, the other way you might have seen, you probably have seen kids that come in and say, well, I want to buy, I want to buy a home. But you know the kids, they don't have any money. The only source of money that the, chil the, the children have is their parents who lives overseas that have cash. So typically, I get calls from realtors that says, can, can the parents wire the money to the kids and the kids turn around and buy the real estate? Is there any problem with that? Oh, yeah. Yes, that money belongs to the parents, not the kids. But they made a gift to the kids oh. to, 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 to okay. use as a down payment for the I'll property? I'll get on the way in, right? On the way in, as soon as it gets, <coughs> it becomes tangible, I'll get taxed. Yeah. There's some issues with, with the way money comes in. and. Or you know, depending on how the money comes in, there's a debate going on whether the the, the, the fact of wiring the money can be a um, you know a, you know versus writing a check you know drawn on a local bank. So the question's not clear cut at exactly what's going on. But the thing is that if there's a physical check written in the U.S., it's considered a U.S. gift and subject to, to U.S. gift tax. But then the question is, okay, what about a wire? When wires is from foreign account into the U.S. account of the child, would that be subject to the gift? It shouldn't be because it's the kid's it's, money. It's a foreign gift, but it's subject to reporting. Okay, there's a reporting requirement. So if a U.S. person receives a gift from a foreigner that comes in, if it, if it exceeds a certain dollar amount, then it's got to be reported to the IRS. And that amount is over one hundred thousand dollars. So if the if the so so typically you'll see like the down payments like three hundred thousand they need it. So they wire it. Okay, now it triggers a report requirement. <coughs> Kids would have to file a report that said they received a foreign gift of three hundred thousand dollars, the money that they used for a down payment. Now, there's another question. 
Was it really a gift of the money to the children? Or was it a gift of the real estate? Because they turn around and use the money to buy the real estate. What do you think? Well, they didn't own the real estate before they got the gift. I'm sorry? They didn't own the real estate before they got the gift. That's true. Does it doesn't matter when the timing in the year where they acquired the property? Does it matter if it's the timing that they got it? Yeah. Well, well, you know that uh, they need the money, they need to buy the property right away, right? So, well, intention. For example, they received the money in December. They, 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 they saw that really nice property in San Marino, <laughs> and that there was like 10, 10 people bidding on, or twenty people bidding on, and they're all trying to beat each other over, trying to get that one house, and your client wants that house, so they have to come up with the cash right away. They can't wait. Obviously, if they could wait, it might be better. The, uh, there was a court case in an IRS uh, ruling or treatment that it was a gift of real estate rather than a gift of cash. So that poses some problems where we see where 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 you know U.S. children are buying you know using their foreign parents' money to turn around and buy real estate in such a short order. So because of that, we usually, one of the things you can do is delay the purchase so that if the gift of cash comes in, wait a year or two so that the money seasons and then turn around to buy the real estate. But of course that real estate may not be there. It's probably worth uh, another half a million dollars more a year or two years later. So, so, so there are some timing issues. So, a lot of times I hear realtors says, oh, can we do this? And it says, when do they want to do this? It says, next week, escrow's going to close, they need to wire the money. Wonderful. <laughs> so, you, so you can see that there are some problems. Most of the people do it and then later find out either through an audit examination or a question because their driver says, how do those teenage kids or college kids can afford a half a million dollar home or a million dollar home? You know? Oh, they got money. Hmm, we better look into this. Oh, gifts from parents. Hmm. Money for the IRS. Gift taxes. Okay, so gift taxes. A lot of these things don't don't come up initially, but but those are the problems that we, we face. Peter and I, you know, being at Pricewaterhouse, we've seen everything. And most of the time we see these things is that after it's too late. It's already been done. You can't undo things. So a lot of times we tell people, gotta plan ahead, gotta plan ahead. Even before you immigrate to the U.S., got to plan ahead because things are not that simple, especially if you're foreign. Mm -hmm. And in these days of mixed marriages where we have one spouse who's a U.S. person and a spouse who's a non-U.S. person, it gets even more trickier. Now, many of you have heard that, that there's an unlimited gift between spouses, correct? Mm -hmm. That if I made a gift to my wife, it's not subject to gift tax. Mm -hmm. and, I could, and it doesn't matter how much I give to her, there's, there's no gift tax, so long as she's a U.S. citizen. If she's not a citizen or a foreigner, there are different rules. There's a limit on it. There's a dollar limit on it. So the, lim the, 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 the transfer amount right now is about $145,000. Not unlimited as between citizen spouses. Okay? So some of those things do affect how we do things in real estate because you know um, I can't I can't just because real estate is more than the, the lousy hundred forty five thousand or the fourteen thousand so the rules get a little more murky and, and trickier. Um, did I see a hand? There was a question? No. Okay. I have a question. Yes. I have a buyer. The uh, uh, the buyer the deposit money from China from uh, three different people. Well, because it's coming. Well, the question is, is that uh, they receive some money as down as a down as a down down payment, but they were gifts from three different relatives, fifty thousand from each different relatives. Um, there's no gift tax from foreigners, if the, all three were foreigners, mm -hmm. but there's a reporting requirement because the person, the U.S. person receives 
over 100,000 in foreign gifts would have to report a foreign gift of, of 150,000 if that's what was transferred. The in. ESCO asked them to send the money directly to ESCO, but the bank in China said they can't do that. They have to send the money to the person. Um, if they send them directly to the ESCO, they don't have to pay them. I don't know the answer to that question because I, that's not dealing with taxes, but it's probably dealing with currency control right. between okay. countries. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, you no, I was going to say, very likely, because uh, China has a very strict uh, foreign, foreign currency uh, exchange control, uh, anything 50000 or less, mm -hmm. then there's no reporting requirement. Mm -hmm. So I, have, I actually have seen deals where a million dollars came on 20 different <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, you think that's crazy? But they're able to, c to go out and find out many people. And I think, and, and then the reason why the money cannot be wired directly. The, the Don't give him a microphone. <laughs> and the reason, well, um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like I'm talking to myself. I'll try. But it's, I, uh, Gary is absolutely right. It has more to do with the China foreign uh, exchange control because China has a very strict foreign exchange control, and anything like 50 or less, then there's no uh, no reporting requirement, and you can send out money. But then those can only be sent to designated person. Uh, I think you know everything to a, to an escort account will be some limitation. Yeah. Okay. Um, before I continue, um, earlier there was a question about business trust. The answer is, it, again, it, it really depends because there's so many definitions of business trust. Uh, Boston has a business trust and Delaware has a business trust, but you know, because they're used so infrequently, they're, they're special purpose types of uh, business entities. And I can't answer that question because I, you know, I don't see it that often to, to tell you what the difference is. Um, most most of the business transactions that I've seen in, involving commercial real estate has been use of corporations, LLCs. Uh, they're the primary vehicles. Um, and that's all I see is, is primarily corporations and LLCs. Uh, we don't, I don't see partnerships that much. Excuse me. Can we go over time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to keep this short. I'll run faster. <laughs> Thank you. How much, time, how much more time do I have? 15 minutes. You see, you see, Peter and I share something in common. Once we get in front of a mic, we can't stop. We enjoy hamming it up. Okay. But what I want to get into, because there was a question that Ling Chao brought up about, well, she heard about the, the Singapore Trust, and the, basically we call it the Foreign Trust. Peter's, Peter... Um, you know, attempt to answer the question, but it's even more complicated than that. Because there's two types of trust. There's what they call a grantor trust, non-grantor trust, and, and it gets more murkier. But the, the thing is, is that trusts are not the ideal way to go. A foreign trust is not the ideal way because of extra um, reporting requirements, restrictions on their use. They're not that favorable as in the past. In the past, foreign trusts were, 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 were ideal, especially in pre-immigration planning where we could use a, what we call a drop-off trust, where we drop things off into a trust before we come into the States and then receive things tax-free. But things have gotten a lot trickier and a little more difficult, so we don't see that much. But one of the diagrams that Peter has, and I don't know where his clicker is. Oh, here it is. I, I want to spend a little bit of time to. Oh, it's not working, huh? That's a laser. Oh, that's the laser button. <laughs> Shoot somebody's eyeballs out. <laughs> oh, left and right. Okay. I, what I want. Oh, not his photo. <laughs> um, let's see. Is this the one? Oh, yeah. Dynasty Trust. One of the planning strategies. And this, I definitely have to charge you $500 an hour because it's really worth it. For a foreign person, if they really, really want to transfer wealth to their U.S. beneficiaries, their children who are living here, on the most tax-efficient basis and create a family bank to boot, is, is the concept of this dynasty trust. 
And the whole point of the dynasty trust, if you know which assets are exempt from gift taxes and, and utilize that, because number one, there's no limit on how much uh, of a foreign gift that a foreigner can make to their U.S. beneficiaries. And if they use a dynasty trust, they avoid two types of taxes, the estate tax, and they avoid the what they call a generation skipping tax. It will be tax, it will be estate tax and generation skipping tax free for as long as the trust exists. So they can go multiple generations. Now the types of gifts that are exempt are what kind of gifts I said earlier? Non-tangible. Intangible. So as long as they make gifts of intangible assets, which means what? Okay. No real estate, okay. no currency, no tangibles. It has to be intangibles. What are intangibles? Anything you can move. Peter left. Where did he go? <laughs> that, that, he has the answer. That's intangible. Or did I insult him when I said that? <laughs> oh boy. Oh shoot, I feel bad. He left, he left me. Oh no, I think he said he had a client appointment, so he might have no, might be on his way. Here. Huh? He's still here. Oh, his bag's still there. Okay, so he's probably stepped out. He's yeah. probably telling his client he's coming late. If I were able, where I lost track. Um, what are intangibles? What What do you think are intangibles? Anything you can move. You, you can't. You can't touch. Thing is, you can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't smell it. But it's worth something. Patents, royalties. Patents, royalties. What else? Love of your children. Could be, could be stocks and bonds. Anything that you know uh, that has value, that that isn't real estate, that isn't in physical form. Okay, can be transferred. So if you have family who has. Um, you know, they could wire, you know, cash to, you know, this, this, this dynasty trust can have a foreign bank account. And they can trans, they can wire money, cash money, into this account overseas. They could fill it with stocks and bonds. But after the trust is established, it doesn't have to stay in cash. It doesn't have to stay in stocks and bonds. You could then invest in real estate, tangible, tangible, real estate, because the trust is, you know, is not is not the the parent any longer. It can do things. It does. It's not limited. So it can turn around. But of course, they shouldn't immediately buy real estate. They should allow the investments to season, you know, a year, two years, but down the line it could gradually change their investment mix. Where they could invest in real estate, commercial real estate, could be, or they could continue their investments in stocks and bonds. Okay? But the beneficiaries will have access to the money um, either via um, distributions of income or loans, so, so there's some benefits because the assets, one, is asset prote is protected from creditors, two, it's, it's sheltered from estate and any future you know, transfer taxes as long as the trust remains in, intact. So, so that's why the dynasty trust is one of the most popular structured forms um, for foreigners coming in. That if you understand how these rules work, there's a possibility that they can you know, make unlimited gifts and stuff. See, the other problem, the rules for a foreigner is different for gifts and different for estate taxes. So if, so if a person dies owning tangible assets or real estate in the U.S., it's subject to the estate tax. And that's not good. So basically, the best thing to do is, is for them not to, but maybe consider the possibility of a dynasty trust. But of course, again, the dynasty trust is not appropriate for everyone. And so it determines on the client's goals and objectives and, um, and, and, and things that they want to do. Because some kids, um, they don't like 
money that's kept away from them. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a little of exchange going going back and forth between the parents and the kids. Of course, the parents would love to keep the money away from the kids, but the kids have other other you know desires on their hands. So there's some little balance that that would need to come on. Now I'm just, I know time's running out and we're over past the time and you know. But is there any questions that I might be able to answer? Uh, foreign companies, um, if you ha uh, foreign companies actually, um, as Peter says, um, you know, they're, they're subject to income tax in the U.S. They may or may not be good vehicles, but typically I've seen um, foreign corporations owning real estate in the U.S. And, but there's some tr tricky tax rules regarding the, the investments of foreign, you know, of U.S. properties in a foreign corporation because of FERTA and because of other things. So, so there requires some very close planning and coordination. Like Peter says, it, it, it all depends on timing, whether they want to dispose of it, or hold it for a short period of time, or for a long period of time, or what they want to do ultimately. So it determines that. Okay? If not, I really want to thank, thank you for your attention. Peter and I, you know, uh, we're very happy to be here. Thank Link Chow for inviting us, and it's great to see some familiar faces. So, you know, good luck in your business, and uh, may you have lots of business. <laughs>